Good Mike where commentaries and Greg Morgan presents the Winged Eagle Podcast. Happy Saturday, everybody. How is it going? Good to see you guys. Welcome to your Winged Eagle podcast for March 23rd, 2024. You know what I just found out not five minutes ago? No collision tonight. I wanted to go and see what was on tap for collision so we could kind of preview it before uh, the end of the podcast here today. And it's not on tonight because of the March Madness tournament. So that's kind of good. That means I'm not confined by time. A lot of times I like to wrap up these podcasts before collision starts as to not take it away from any of you guys. But since there is no collision, we don't have to rush through it. Although I don't think I have enough material to really extend beyond two hours today, but we do have a lot of fun things to talk about. I thought it was a pretty relatively fun week in pro wrestling. I might give the nod to AEW this week for the more fun show. I did enjoy Dynamite. Smackdown last night had its moments, but man, that Cody and Roman segment was really underwhelming. Monday Night Raw this past week I also really liked and thought they had a good thing, a lot of good things happening on Raw as well. So despite last night's maybe somewhat underwhelming or weaker SmackDown, even though I still don't think the show was that bad, it was a great week of pro wrestling. All three shows, boom, boom, boom. And of course, we're right in the middle of WrestleMania season coming up in just a couple of weeks here. And we have Die Nasty coming up for AEW, which is also looking to be a really nice card. So it's a good time to be a wrestling fan right now. You know what I mean? Hopefully you guys are having a great weekend and a great Saturday so far. A lot of things on tap today. I had a busy day and I had a lot going on, so I didn't organize my notes as well as I wanted to, but some of the things we are going to discuss today is or are the Goldberg comments that he made on Asuka. We're definitely going to touch on that. We're going to talk about the Slammy Awards coming back. We're going to talk about the latest on MJF and AEW. We're going to talk about Ronda Rousey's very interesting comments in her new upcoming book to be released in a couple of weeks as she spills the tea on WWE and has a lot of very crazy things to say about them. We're going to read you a couple of excerpts from her book today as well about uh, Vince McMahon and the WWE culture and just the uh, company in general. Really interesting stuff coming from the baddest woman on the planet. We're also going to talk about Jack Perry and the whirlwind of news surrounding him this week. And it sounds like uh, our good friend Dave is getting a lot of shit wrong. Uh, but despite everything, despite the the light years long line of people waiting to dunk on Dave, I still like Dave, uh, but we will talk about Jack Perry and what's going on with him and AEW and what Tony Khan had to say about him. And we're going to talk about, like I said, last night's SmackDown and what we saw from The Rock and Cody Rhodes and what that might mean going into their WrestleMania Night 2 match for the title that now seems like it's taken a back seat to what The Rock is doing and the Night 1 match, which is a little bit crazy, but not the end of the world yet. Still plenty of time to kind of pull that nose up and get them, you know, the proper amount of, of excitement and enthusiasm that they're looking for. And I think WWE will probably hear the criticisms from the fans from last night's segment and maybe turn up the dial next time they get in the ring prior to WrestleMania, which hopefully there will be at least one more confrontation. I don't know if they're going to do a contract signing or not, but I think after last night, we need to see Cody and Roman in the ring again. It kind of needs to happen. And we need the intensity turned up a lot more than it was last night. But we will be getting into that SmackDown last night and what we saw from Rey Mysterio. Big news on SmackDown as well. Next week, Jade Cargill will be making her debut, which did surprise me. I thought they would wait until after Mania. But since she is debuting next week, that does make me think that we could see her still link up with Bianca, perhaps. I mean, it looks like it's going to be Bianca and Naomi, but I think maybe it could be Bianca, Bianca, Naomi, Jade, and maybe somebody else going up against all of damage control. Is that what they're going to do? Or maybe it's, yeah, I guess the other three. Maybe it's going to be a six woman. Maybe there's going to be no uh, tag match, uh, tag title match for the Kabukis. Maybe it's going to be, be the Kabukis and Dakota having to go up against Bianca, Naomi, and Jade, and they're going to get their fucking asses kicked if that happens. Maybe that's what they're setting up, but we are going to see Jade next week. Got a video package for her as we did Braun Breaker. The uh, tag team qualifying. Uh, it's really hard to keep track of this because it's so fucking convoluted, but they're basically qualifying qualifying teams for that crazy ladder match at WrestleMania. So we had that going on last night as we did on Monday Night Raw on Monday. And LA Knight went to AJ Styles' house. I got a big kick out of that as well. 
And it does look like they are setting and laying the groundwork for what Rey Mysterio, Dominic, and uh, Santos Escobar are going to do at WrestleMania as well, based on what we saw last night. This past week on Dynamite was a lot of fun as well. New champion was crowned, fun main event, Osprey, Mercedes, lots of good stuff going on on Dynamite, and we will be talking about that as well. So that's kind of what's on the menu for this afternoon. Again, I want to wish you guys all a happy weekend and happy Saturday, and thank you so much for being with us Today, first thing you guys can do, as always, smash that thumbs up button for me if you don't mind. And if you are not subscribed, please become a subscriber. Would really appreciate that. Subscriptions and likes and comments down below if you're watching this on demand all really help the algorithms and they help drive the channel. All that stuff really important. All that stuff is really important. So if you could hook us up, we would appreciate it here. Also, I want to let you guys know what to expect from us this weekend. It's going to be a busy, busy weekend. The first thing I want to tell you guys about <clears throat> is about a video that I dropped yesterday. Yet another YouTube collaboration. This time, Steve from the Going and Raw podcast joined us to rank The Rock's WrestleMania matches. I ranked Bret Hart's matches with the Sala Monster. We ranked Shawn Michaels' matches with Brian Zane from Wrestling With Regret. And since The Rock kind of has a big role in this year's WrestleMania, I thought we had to do him too, so we invited Steve on. We had a great time recording that episode earlier on in the week. I edited it and uh, dropped it yesterday. It's right there on the top of my channel, so if you've not seen that, please check it out. It was a lot of fun doing that, and thank you again to Steve for joining us this week on the channel. <clears throat> also, I dropped this week on Wednesday a 30th anniversary review of WrestleMania 10. So if you've not checked that video out either, it's about an hour long. Both of those videos are up on the channel right now, right on the latest content tab. And under the latest content playlist, if you go to my channel, you will see a WrestleMania 40 playlist. Now, I want you guys to all please check that out because in that playlist, you will see every WrestleMania related video we've done so far this year. About four watch alongs so far. We got another one coming up tomorrow. And also those three collaborations we've done, the WrestleMania 10 review and a couple of other videos are all on that WrestleMania playlist along with everything we're going to be doing WrestleMania weekend. So we've got the live stream scheduled for the Hall of Fame and SmackDown. We've got the live stream watch party and review scheduled for Saturday night one and Sunday night two. We're going to be up here Monday night after WrestleMania for the Raw After Mania. And we have a lot of those links are already up on the channel. So please check out that in the WrestleMania 40 playlist. Also, this coming Monday, two days from now, Monday Night Raw, we're also going to be here live after Raw, and the link to that is also up on the latest content tab as well. So just go to my channel. You will see the links to all this shit. Set your notification. Give it a like. Save it for later. We're going to be up here... <clears throat> watching or discussing, excuse me, reviewing CM Punk's return to Monday Night Raw this Monday, which should be pretty interesting. And tomorrow on the channel, I know I'm all over the place with this, uh, with these, <laughs> with these videos, but tomorrow on the channel, it is Sunday classic watch along night, and we're going to be watching WrestleMania 15. I was at that show in Philly the last time WrestleMania was in Philadelphia, all the way back in 1999, 25 years ago. So we're going to be watching that together tomorrow to watch Butterbean knocked the fuck out of Bart Gunn. That was a lot of fun. I'll share whatever memories I can remember of the show with you guys tomorrow night as we're watching that. And one week from tomorrow, the final Sunday before WrestleMania, the final WrestleMania watch along of the season is going to be WrestleMania 13. Austin and Brett, the link to that is also up on my channel. You can find it not only in the latest content tab, but also in the WrestleMania 40 season playlist. It's right there. Please do me a favor, go over there, save all this stuff and set your notifications because we have a lot of content and videos and a whole lot of my bald face and head coming at you guys in the next couple of weeks. I cannot wait. It's going to be fun. And also tomorrow I'm actually recording with Tom Talks Rubbish. So look for me on his channel coming up uh, probably in the next few days. I'll let you guys know about that as well once we bust out that recording tomorrow. So Good Mike Work is a busy dude at WrestleMania or during WrestleMania season. It's been a wild one, but it's also been a fun one. So that is pretty much what's on tap. Before we get into the news, I still have not said hi to you guys, so let me just do that real quick. Say hello to everybody in the chat, knock out some channel member uh, shout-outs, and see if there's any super chats here, and then I'll shut my fucking mouth. Or, I mean, I won't shut my mouth. I'll shut my mouth as it relates to that. And we'll get into wrestling news, and I do need to pick a top topic. Normally, I organize my notes of what I want to talk about first, and I was too busy to do that today. So, uh, 
I am going to start with, I think we're going to start with Goldberg. Shouldn't we start with Goldberg? Yeah, stay tuned for some comments on Goldberg and Asuka in just a minute. What a fucking prick. Anyway, good to see Jay Lambo in the house. Let's do some channel members first. Jay Lambo, good to see you. Red Raven Rucker, Danny in Oak Park, and my boy Amato is here. Hey, Greg, finishing up a 54-hour week at work. Goddamn. Going to be like that for a while. Thought I'd hang out with everyone. Got one more. Got one more out till I out. One more hour, maybe, until you're out. Well, good luck getting rid of that final hour or getting finished with that final hour. I also work about 50 to 60 hours a week, but a lot of that is spent here in my own home, so it doesn't feel like work. 50 hour, 54 hours outside of my home is a lot. Good luck, Amato. Best of luck with the rest of your day. My friend, Max Pokebro wants us to get to 1,000 likes. You guys should do what Max says because I've seen Max when he's pissed and you don't want to get on Max's bad side. Uh, Tatanani is here as well. Good to see you, my friend. So is Jimmy Anderson, 18-month, year-and-a-half shoot brother, kayfabe brother, excuse me. Uh, good evening, Jimmy from Switzerland, right? Switzerland. Why do I always not know if it's Switzerland or Sweden? I think it's Switzerland. I'm an idiot. Don't mind me, Jimmy. Always good to see you. Thank you for the super chat. So I guess we are getting Ray vs. Dom again at WrestleMania. I don't know, Jimmy. I, it might. I mean, Dominic cost Ray Mysterio the match last night. They might want to do that rematch again. I mean, last year was a lot of fun. I loved the Dominic and Ray match. But what I think they're setting up here for is a multi-man thing. I think it's going to be Dominic teaming up with maybe... I mean, I know it's kind of factions you know, cross-pollinating here, but I think it might be Dominic... And uh, Legato del Fantasma, maybe, right? Taking on Ray and the LWO. And I think this is where Dominic is going to get his win back. I think Dominic and Ray probably won't wrestle one-on-one, -on -one, probably. That's, my, that's what my instinct tells me, but I could be way wrong. If it turns out to be a multi-man match like I think it's going to be, that's where I think Ray's going to lose, and Dominic might even pin his dad at WrestleMania to make that whole situation full circle. We will see, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Good to see Victor Cologne. Isaac as well is here. We got Sonic plays. Zach Pelgett is in the house. And Luke McCaptain, Luke McAllister chiming in with 10 bucks for us. Hey, Greg, felt like Roman and Cody misfired on SmackDown, but still looking forward to their match, especially if they really go nuts with how they book it. Feel like they can do more in the next two weeks. I do too. Wasn't there a situation to help me remember? Wasn't there a situation regarding this where the segment, we were a little bit disappointed about it, and then they really turned it up in the next one? What It seemed like that was a recent example of something like this that happened, where the fans really weren't that enamored with what we saw, and then the next time they come around, the following week, it was like way better. It might even be with these guys, Cody and Roman. I don't remember what I'm trying to think of here, but I feel like... That's been a pretty loud sentiment from the fans since last night about how most felt a little bit disappointed and underwhelmed by what Cody and Roman did. So that's WWE's cue to do it better next time. It ain't too late yet. It's just one segment. You still have a couple of more Fridays and Mondays before you get to WrestleMania and plenty of time to create another segment or have another wild bonker segment that maybe gets physical, maybe a brawl, pull apart something exciting that really gets the fans to just forget all about what we just saw. So that's what I'm holding out hope for for next week, uh, Luke, because we know The Rock is going to be back on SmackDown, I think, next week. And then the following nights, the following Monday's Raw in Brooklyn. I think that's the go home. That's going to be the April 1st Raw in Brooklyn. Rock's going to be on that show. So hopefully something really fun happens in these next four or five TVs that we have left before we get to Mania, there's still time to kind of fix what they fucked up last night in my mind. Denny Down Bad, good to see you as well. Victor Colon, did I get you? Mike Witt, pretty sure. Yes, yeah, Sweden, Jimmy, thank you. Uh, I think I got Mike Witt. Good to see uh, MJ Parker as well. I think that hit most of the channel members. Oh, Zane G, good to see you too. Let's circle back and say hi to Bonkers, LFC, Green P, Exotic Exchange, Tony, Green, oh, I got you already, V1LL1N, <laughs> whatever that is, Squared Circle Oracle, plus Beats Yourself Up. Right on, good to see you as well. Beetle911, Jacob a Addy, seventh season is here. We have Gilbert Arbalo, Navid is in the house, so is Mike Rouse. We got Daniel Mendola, good to see you, my friend. Also, Rob Strickland, King Azza is here, Vash Starwind we got, uh, along with Rarely Even. Good to see you, my friend. Drop it in the five bucks. What if Edge wanted to do the cutting edge on AEW? What would he call it? The cutting Copeland? Um, the coping edge? Uh, I don't know. Coping. Ooh, co well, coping is kind of like an edge on like a skateboard or, or a skate ramp, right? Coping? 
I don't know. You could probably play with the words a little bit there, rarely even, and find a talk show for him to do. I don't know if I want that from Edge, though. I don't know if I want that from Adam Copeland in AEW. I want my Adam Copeland in AEW to be different than my Edge in WWE. And I don't even know if they really need him to do that there. They got enough talk show segments and things like that. I think this is a kind of a, a you know a personal legacy project for Adam Copeland. I think he's having fun there. I think fans are have been enjoying what they've been seeing f- with, from him working with Christian. Now he's the TNT champion and he's probably going to drop that belt and give the rub to someone which I think is really great. And I actually have enjoyed Copeland in AEW. I have few complaints about him there. Uh, a lot of people just feel like because he's not as big of a feeling star as he was in WWE. That means it sucks. It doesn't. (laughs) This was his choice to go there. He knew. He knew what he was doing. He knew how big AEW was compared to WWE. It's not like he got there and be like, oh shit, this place is really small. I had no idea. He knew. He knew exactly what he was getting into and he's having a blast. And I don't mind what he's doing there at all. Uh, Mohammed, good to see you as well. Um, Anybody else that I'm missing, I apologize if I'm missing you, but we got to get into our business for today. Big J, Good to see you. Cherokee George, Mark Simpson, also good to see you. Daniel Barry Sports, Colin Wright is here. And Brandon McNeil, I'm not sure if I got you earlier, channel member, Brandon McNeil. Always happy to see you. Steve Jacobson is here as well, and I think that ought to do it. Why don't we get into some news? Let's get into some wrestling news first. Then after we get into these new t- news tidbits, we're going to talk about SmackDown. We're going to talk about last night's SmackDown Then we'll preview this Monday's Raw. Then we'll finish things up with AEW Dynamite and maybe even preview Dynasty and what's looking like the card is going to be for that show. But why don't we start off with something kind of funny, something that's not really that infuriating. It's just eye rolling. And that's our good old friend, Mr. Bill Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg is a very kind individual. What I like about Goldberg is that sometimes he might worry that the fans might forget What a huge, colossal, entitled fucking douchebag he is. And he goes out of his way to remind us of what a huge, colossal fucking douchebag he is when he does an interview every now and then. And he spoke to Nothing Left Unsaid podcast this week, where I don't even know what the context was, but he was something was was brought up about his time in WWE. And he says about his winning streak and some of the issues he had there, and I quote, Well... A girl beat my winning streak, beat my undefeating, beat my undefeated streak. I can't even remember. Asuka was her name, some Japanese girl, and they touted her as being the one to have the longest winning streak. And it just so happened that that culminated when I got there, right? When he, like, I don't know if you saw the video, when he says this, you want to punch his fucking face through the screen. He sounds like such an asshole. This guy really thinks that he is a Babe Ruth, Hulk Hogan, Bruno San Martino, Stone Cold Steve Austin level icon in the business. Goldberg made his mark. Goldberg, you know, pretty much became a household name. I'm never going to deny what Goldberg did during his short run in the late 90s there. And then when WWE brought him back in 2016, and I didn't even really hate that. But He has had a, it feels like Goldberg's had this inflated, entitled ego his whole career. He's always believed his own bullshit. I think he's had very, very bad teachers right from the beginning. He was, he had the worst influences around him in WCW, you know, in terms of, you know, how to conduct business and that type of thing. And I feel like he really got sucked into that big ego stuff and just watching him throughout the years, the things that he says and does, even that little confrontation he had a few years back backstage with like Matt Riddle where he's actually trying to like stand up to Matt Riddle I'm like that dude would eat you for lunch motherfucker you already got your ass kicked once by Jericho in the backstage area you want to get face to face with this UFC fighter who's half your age I mean what the fuck this guy is so out of his mind and full of himself and every time he's done an interview I've talked about it before that I've always just I'm not like slinging crazy hate on Goldberg. He just seems like an extremely unlikable individual. I could not sit around and talk to this guy for more than five seconds without just walking away. And he just really, he's just an asshole. I don't know. I don't know how to describe him other than that. He's an asshole that thinks he's bigger and more important to the business than he is. And he dismisses a great women's wrestler 
some Japanese girl. Brother, you were on the same WrestleMania card as her. You were both in championship matches at WrestleMania 33. Or maybe it was 34, I'm thinking. When, when was the Asuka-Charlotte match? That was probably 34. Either way, Goldberg has shared arenas with Asuka before. If you do the math, there's probably a time where they were both even a champion in the company. I don't know, but they might have been. And for him to not know who she is, she's been there, what, 10 years now? Asuka has been with the company for, fuck, maybe not 10. I, I'd say eight, eight, nine. It's been a long fucking time. And for him to not even know how to pronounce her name, she's some Japanese girl. This has got old white dude entitlement written all over it. This is exactly the way your Trump supporting uncle would talk. Some Japanese girl. What do you mean some Japanese girl? She's been there for a fucking decade. She's won umpteen fucking titles. She's more decorated than your ass. And she's had infinitely more matches in time in a WWE ring than you. You know, I mean, if you take all of Goldberg's WWE matches from that year run he had in the, in the early 2000s and then coming back a couple years later and beating the Fiend and all that stupid shit that he did, it doesn't amount to a fraction of what Asuka has done. Now, fans just want to sit there and, and debate, oh, Goldberg, who's the bigger star overall, Asuka or Goldberg? Goldberg was the star in this era and he sold all this merch. That's fine to debate that. That's fine. I don't care about that. What I'm talking about is Goldberg being so dismissive, so entitled to think that WWE just purposely threw his undefeated streak in the trash and gave it to some Japanese girl just to mess with him. You know, like I know Goldberg has never really gotten along with Triple H. I believe he said as much in this interview. But just to, to say something like that and to, to describe a wrestler, a current wrestler in WWE's roster that's one of the most decorated, one of the top women stars there that's been that way for close to a decade, and to dismiss her as some Japanese girl whose name you can't even pronounce is fucking insulting. And if I was a member of the women's roster or anybody on the current roster, I'd be like, who does this motherfucker think he is? To be so dismissive of somebody that's featured on TV every week that all of the fans know, if you are a modern wrestling fan, if you're a wrestling fan, a young kid, boy, girl, whatever age you are, and you're a fan of pro wrestling, you know who Asuka is. Chances are you like Asuka. And to hear this old fuck be so dismissive when he was so lucky in my mind, I'm sure Goldberg has had his issues with WWE internally and all of that. But this guy never needs to pretend that he was treated unfairly in that company. He was treated too fairly. He was put over too much. He won too many matches in my mind. I will never forgive WWE for having him beat The Fiend. I know he didn't decide that. They decided that, even though I think he claimed that, oh, what are my kids are going to, what are they going to think if I lose to a monster or whatever? Goldberg, back in the days of Vince McMahon, might have had some say or pull in what the outcome of his matches were. And the fact that he was able to work, you know, a, a schedule easier than Brock, imagine that. Imagine working a schedule easier than Brock. That's what he did. He never wrestled. His matches, even when he was in his physical prime, his matches were shit. They were just intense, and he was great at playing that character. But in terms of what he could do in the ring, his ability, his technique, his athleticism, you know, this guy fucking can't hold 80% of the roster's jock, even when he was in his prime. You know, imagine putting Braun Breaker in a 1997 ring with Goldberg. He'd hold his own against Goldberg. Goldberg was a freak of nature, and he had he probably one of the best overall looks in the business. But when you see the way athletes in, in all sports are, you know, in basketball, they're outgrowing the court. <laughs> you know, back when I watched Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars and even Michael Jordan were skinny little pricks running around the court. Now LeBron takes up half the fucking court because he's jacked. You know, and wrestling is the same way. They're getting bigger, faster, more agile, more athletic, more intense. Everything is just more, 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 more. And I think to, to be so dismissive of somebody that's a really big part of the company, you know, that you once represented is just kind of shitty. It's self-centered. It's very self-centered. And it's, one, it's example number 852, why I think Goldberg is a piece of shit. So Goldberg, stop being a dick. And for God's sake, stop doing fucking interviews, you fucking asshole. Anyway, that's all I have to say about Mr. Goldberg. Fuck you very much, Bill. Uh, let's talk about uh, since we're on the since the, uh, we're on the subject of uh, people talking about WWE. What about Ronda Rousey? Oh my God! Now Ronda Rousey, I've disagreed with a lot of her opinions before. Uh, she said some pretty fucked up shit and had some pretty fucked up 
Aaron Rodgers, Joe Rogan level, you know, beliefs and conspiracies that, you know, run around in her head because all those people are fucking crazy. And I know, you know, 10 years ago she had the Sandy Hook thing and uh, she's one of those those delusional conspiracists that just think the fucking government is just watching her when she goes into 7-Eleven to buy a big gulp and shit like that. So I don't really take a whole lot of stock in anything she says at all, ever. However... If you take away all that and you just judge what Ronda Rousey is saying here in her upcoming book entitled Our Fight comes out April 4th, her new autobiography, I should say, and you just judge it by based on what she says about WWE and WWE only, what I love about Ronda in this, you know, in the position that she finds herself in, which she even says, I believe, either in uh, in part of the transcripts that I'm going to read you or another part of the book is that, you know, she is, she is not handcuffed by WWE. She never has to worry about saying something bad about them hurting her professionally later on in life. She has no plans to go back there. She's in a position and a big enough name in the world where she doesn't need, you know, WWE. They don't have her by the balls. They don't have her in a position where even if she does have dirt on the company, she can't really say anything, you know, because that's the way a lot of People have been, you know, with WWE. A lot of people still maybe have aspirations to come back one day or, oh, I better not burn this bridge. Rhonda sounds like she gives zero fucks here. And she had some really interesting things to say in this book. Now, again, the book does not come out for a couple of weeks, but some excerpts have surfaced. And here's the first. Now, these transcripts are via Inside the Ropes. Here's what she said about Vince McMahon. I mean, it's supposed to be on Vince, but it's about a lot of things. And I quote, NXT was founded by and under the control of Triple H. In addition to being my in-ring WrestleMania nemesis, he is arguably one of the best professional wrestlers in history and one of the better people on the business side. He's married to Stephanie, who was the daughter of WWE's Emperor Palpatine, Vince McMahon. Vince took over the company from his father in the early 80s and spent the better part of 40 years playing a real-world pro wrestling version of Monopoly, buying up and absorbing smaller promotions until he basically owned them all. It's hard sometimes to know where the evil, unethical slime ball character of Vince played out for the cameras ends and the actual questionably ethical many times sued and multiple times accused of sexual misconduct Vince McMahon begins that blurred line between character and reality is a reoccurring theme within the WWE universe pay-per-views are held in major cities like New York Los Angeles and Philly as well as now twice a year in Saudi Arabia a nation that restricts the rights of women in a way I'm certain Vince McMahon wishes he could Holy shit. On WWE's culture, she says this. WWE bills itself as a sports entertainment organization, and just like in the mainstream entertainment industry, there was, by all accounts, a casting couch culture where men backstage in powerful positions pressured female talent for sexual favors in return for airtime. There were so many public accusations and scandals, it's hard to keep track, and more than I'm sure the WWE managed to sweep under the rug. <clears throat> Women weren't just being demeaned backstage, but center stage. Up until 2007, bra and panties matches where female wrestlers won the match by stripping their opponent down to her underwear were an actual fucking thing. <laughs> Even after that gimmick was retired by WWE executives, I'm sure very reluctantly and with a lot of lamenting about political correctness, it was still clear that the organization placed more value on a, on a woman's physical appearance than her physical ability. Rhonda is 100% right about that. That entire fucking paragraph is perfectly said. She's right. <clears throat> She's absolutely right. Goes on. She goes on to say that the Divas era, with its pink rhinestone butterfly title belt, dawned around the same time. Women, while now portrayed as wrestlers, were still expected to look a certain way. I think, uh, I think lots of makeup, little clothing, little clothing, and huge boobs. It would take almost another decade, years after I proved women could could be a huge combat sports attraction before women truly started to get the time in the squared circle, what diehards, co what diehards call a pro wrestling ring. It was only after WWE was basically armbarred into it, following a global social media backlash to give Divas a chance after Divas were given a total of 30 seconds, less time than it takes most people to read this paragraph for a nationally televised tag match. Four women were given were given less time to collectively wrestle than every single man on the roster got for his intro music alone. 
presented this information as a person outside of the wrestling world, you might draw the conclusion that there is a troubling foundational sexist uh, patriarchal culture with the WWE. You would be right. I have nothing but respect for the female wrestlers who paved the way for women's wrestlers today and nothing but disgust for the amount of sexist, degrading bullshit that they were put through. So that is just a snippet of the entire book. So Rhonda seems like somebody who isn't going to sit by and not speak up. She has WWE has no leverage over her and that I've talked about that before. I've talked about that about like certain wrestlers throughout the years. I've mentioned guys like The Rock and Chris Jericho and Brock Lesnar all before they came back to WWE or whenever they were not in WWE, they weren't relying on WWE to to get exposure or get more publicity or or, or for further their professional career. Chris Jericho had Fozzy. He was doing a bunch of other, you know, narrating spots and guest spots on TV. He was out there in the world. He didn't need WWE to survive. Brock Lesnar, same thing. Left WWE, went to go play football, went to the UFC, and everybody knew who he was. And Brock Lesnar had success and found success and made a lot of money without having to be in WWE. The Rock, obviously, same thing. And I've always like like kind of uh, appreciated the fact that there are people and wrestlers out there and, and wrestling personalities that aren't handcuffed by WWE, that WWE isn't squeezing them by their nuts, you know, forcing them to say whatever they want them to. There are people out there that are going to be able to come forward because WWE's got nothing on them. And Rhonda is one of those people. She is set for life money-wise. She's never going to need to come back to wrestling for money. She might want to come back for fun. And if she's already decided in her head, morally, WWE is just not where she's ever going to want to be again, then she feels confident saying these things. And I think that's great. And I love when somebody has made themselves a good enough career to where they don't have to worry about WWE and their pettiness causing them any problems at all. They can say whatever they want, and WWE can't do shit. So even though I don't have not always agreed with Ronda Rousey and things that she's done and said in her life, I am very much in agreement with her about the little excerpts I read from her book about the culture in WWE. A lot of what she says you know, it's well-written and well-worded, but it's not surprising at all. These are all things that we were all aware of, you know, it's just, you know, kind of coming out and being confirmed here by Ronda Rousey. And I think that's great. So WWE, I'm sure, is uh, just loving this. And I'm sure there's going to be even more coming out when the book is actually released. So interesting stuff there. Let's switch gears a little bit. First, we talked about Goldberg being a dick, then Ronda shitting all over WWE. That was fun. But let's talk about something that may or may not be fun. The return of the Slammy Awards. Now, I kind of got my I kind of got my wish here and I kind of didn't. I've been advocating for years that WWE bring back the Slammy Awards and it would be great if they kind of brought them back the way they were in like 96, 97, 86, 87, where, you know, you'd rent a banquet hall. And then in the 90s, they were doing it the night before WrestleMania. But then that kind of morphed into the Hall of Fame. And I always thought it would be fun to bring the Slammys back and not attach it to a Raw or SmackDown or just fold it into that. It's just so meaningless that way. You know, have it where people are actually in evening gowns and tuxes and, and rent out a banquet thing and do it like you used to do, but they've just never really done that. And now it sounds like it's going to be during the day. The Slammys are coming back to the world. WWE, the world in Philadelphia, WrestleMania weekend, Sunday, April 7th. So they're going to be giving out awards like Superstar of the Year, Faction of the Year, Return of the Year, Rivalry of the Year, Entrance of the Year, Match of the Year, OMG Moment of the Year, NXT Star of the Year, Social Media Star of the Year, and Breakout Star of the Year. Now, with everybody having to be at WrestleMania that day, this sounds like I think Big E's going to be a part of this, maybe Kathy Kelly. So this just might be like a fan type of thing. It might be like a kid's choice type of uh, shit. I'm not sure how the setup is going to be here. And correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. Is is this WWE World thing? Isn't is that just what the fan access is? Is they have they just changed the name of it? I was at WrestleMania last year and we didn't go to any of this. So now it's the world. Is this just like a rebranding of the name of like the the fan access festivities? Is that all this is? I don't even know, to be honest with you. But anyway, the Slammies are coming back Sunday, April 7th. I can't see how any wrestlers are going to be live for this because you got WrestleMania. I mean, maybe some of the ones that aren't booked, night two, can be there. But shit, I don't even know how all that's going to work. Slammy Awards are coming back in some weird form Sunday, April 7th. I'll be off all that day, so I will try to watch it. 
Maybe we can stream an all-day WrestleMania thing. We'll, we'll figure that out. Link to Night 1 and Night 2's Watch Party is up on my channel on my WrestleMania 40 season playlist, so be sure to check that out. MJF apparently has been removed from AEW shop. None of his merchandise is available, and you know what that means. He's going to debut in WWE. MJF will be at WrestleMania confirmed. You heard it here first. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't mean jack shit. MJF is not going anywhere. MJF is under AEW contract. MJF will be back. He might even be back at Dynasty because there's some opportunities there for him to stick his uh, face in. So maybe that's what they're planning. So to get ahead of that, they're going to kind of remove him from merch stuff to try to make fans think he's leaving. I just think they're trying to keep kayfabe alive is all either that or they got some new merch for him coming out. I don't know. Uh, but I don't really think that's a sign of anything. And I just think at this point, it's a matter of when Max is going to come back. I did see a report from Sean Ross Sapp where, you know, maybe his recovery on his injury is going a little slower than normal, but I don't think uh, that there's really any set time for him to come back. And he probably is good to come back at any point. We just don't really know yet, but I don't think the merchandise removal is anything whatsoever uh, to worry about, but it is on my list of notes. So I thought I would mention it. What else do I have on my news? We're kind of all over the place today. Sorry about that. Sticking with uh, AEW, we'll talk about uh, Jack Perry. Now, as a podcaster, here's something that does get a little bit frustrating. It's annoying, I'm not annoying enough, but it's one thing to come up here and try to report news or try to report something that we've heard that was, that was reported by, you know, a credible wrestling source or a website. What I don't like doing <laughs> is having to then backtrack and then talk about previously incorrect stories that were incorrect for a certain reason and, and and Dave's not getting things right and people are getting worked. And that's happened a couple times this week with Jack Perry and The Rock. Now, last week it was The Rock, the, the, the story coming out about how some of the talent might be upset or frustrated about this perceived double standard with The Rock and the language he's allowed to use on social media and in his promos, how he doesn't seem to have to, uh, you know, adhere to the standards and practices that everybody else does. And I laughed at that and I told the wrestlers to suck it the fuck up because you're not The Rock. The Rock can do whatever he wants. I don't know if anybody is not aware of this or not, but newsflash, life is not fair. We have all had examples of this in our own lives, at our jobs. There, there's probably a million examples each one of us can think of in our head, in our personal lives, that has not been fair. Situations we've found ourselves in that has not been fair. That's life. And what I told the talent is if they are really are upset about this, then just go out there and become as big of a star as The Rock. That's all you got to do. If you do that, then you can say fuck on your Instagram posts too. But until you do that, I think you should just shut your fucking mouth about it. Now, we've heard multiple reports about this. Uh, the Rock directly responded to one of these reports by Dave Meltzer uh, last night. I think it was WrestleMania had posted the quote and then Rock responded to that like this is complete horseshit. Everybody, like I said, there is a there is a light years long line of people just waiting, waiting to dunk on our Uncle Dave. And I'm just not going to be that way. I like Dave. I don't really I don't really I, I see so many people dedicating their online personalities, <coughs> Eric Bischoff, <coughs> to despising the very existence of this man. And I think that's a really strange way to live. Now, I personally believe that Sean Ross Sapp is the new go-to guy for wrestling news. I think he does great work. I think Fightful does great work. In my mind, you know, I mean, I don't say this shit out loud a lot, but, you know, Sean's the new Meltzer in my mind. You know, back when I was younger, back in the 90s, Dave was the go-to guy. Sean's the go-to guy now. And that's pretty cool. You know, I'm kind of friendly with the guy who's, you know, the, the top uh, news guy in wrestling. That's awesome. Sean's a friend of ours. We love his work. But Dave, you know, even though he's kind of getting older and he's getting dunked on a lot and he's getting a lot of shit wrong and he might even be getting worked <laughs> by, you know, uh, some talent, WWE disinforming, maybe purposely working the sheets, that type of thing, putting this out there, which makes a lot of sense because it would really it would really line up with Rock's on screen character. You know, because on screen, he's mentioning his TKO board status and he's everybody's boss and he can do this and do that. And if you get the story out there that he's also a prick behind the scenes and, and wrestlers are also upset with him behind the scenes, that actually just adds to him. So I could totally see WWE purposely misinforming Dave. No problem. 
So it sounds like that was probably all bullshit, which I'm glad it was because when I heard that, I thought it was absurd. I'm like, wait, you mean to tell me like, no, these wrestlers can't, they, these wrestlers understand they are not dumber than the fans. The, the wrestlers know that Dwayne is going to get some leniency. He's going to get to do stuff that not everybody does. They are in wrestling. Their whole fucking life has been built on this. They've been to a lot of shows and, and probably worked on a lot of pay-per-views where it was all about somebody else, that type of thing. And nobody was even really thinking about them. So I don't think, I, I think the wrestlers are of the mentality of Rock is here to help make this WrestleMania season great, you know, and I don't think too many wrestlers should really, at least right now, be resenting The Rock. The Rock, even though he is commanding a lot of attention in this, he, he may, his, his, his electrifying, entertaining status and the way he is and this, this over-the-top rock, rock character could be harming Roman and Cody a little bit. We'll talk about that. But in terms of who he is and what he can do and what he's allowed to do, I kind of thought that story was a little bit shit. And it's it sounds like, you know, Dave might have gotten that wrong and WWE might have purposely worked him a little bit there. Another story is the Jack Perry stuff. Now, this thing was all over the place, too, because I think what originally happened is that it was reported by Dave that... Tony Khan was mad at Jack Perry for costing him CM Punk, and he tried to call him and apologize, and Tony Khan wouldn't return his call. And that, that's why I refuse to like really make detailed notes on this, because the story is about what's actually happening. I don't want to spend 20 minutes talking about what people got wrong. That's a waste of fucking time. So something like that was reported by Dave. Then Brian Alvarez, uh, I guess, had spoken to Jack Perry, and here is what uh, was reported by Alvarez on the Wrestling Observer newsletter, and I quote: "Jack Perry both disputes the claim that he continually, then he continually, I can't even say it, continually apologized or asked for forgiveness in the months following his backstage fight with CM Punk at last year's All In, or that there are any current plans for an AEW return. So he disputes both of those claims. According to Perry." He didn't hear from AEW head Tony Khan for two months following All In. Perry said he never texted to say he was sorry and told Khan's lawyers he would not initiate first contact. Khan finally set up an in-person meeting before Full Gear where they discussed plans to bring him back last December. However, after Punk returned at the Survivor Series, those plans were scrapped. Probably smart. I mean, if they did have plans... To bring Jungle Boy back in in December, that would have been just a couple of weeks after Punk returned and probably smart to not go through with those plans, honestly. Um, Perry, who had wanted to work Wrestle Kingdom but was unable to for logistical reasons, then worked with Rocky Romero and Khan to set up his current New Japan run. At this point, Perry is still under AEW contract. He asked for a release but was denied, so apparently... Jack Perry asked for his release, according to Alvarez. Again, I don't even know what's fucking true here. I'm just reading you what's here. Uh, but there are still no plans to bring him back. He hasn't talked to Khan in months, nor cleared anything he has done in storyline for New Japan, like him tearing up the AEW contract or his use of the term scapegoat. So that's what Brian had to say. Then Tony Khan addressed this when speaking to Comic Book Nation. Here's what Tony Khan had to say this week about Jack Perry. Quote, Jack's doing great things in New Japan, the New Japan Cup. He's had a great run. He's established himself over there. He feels he's the scapegoat, but he's doing great things. And he's wrestling for a great promotion. And it's been great tracking Jack's progress in New Japan. And I think he's done excellent work. And he also said something to the effect of stay tuned or keep watching. So that does not sound like a guy, unless he's just being an incredibly diplomatic there and he doesn't want to reveal too much. This does not sound like a guy who's really that upset with Jack Perry. And I think maybe, you know, what Perry is, is telling Alvarez, you know, might be, you know, somewhat in kayfabe because he does have this scapegoat character, the con scapegoat character, the contract tear up and whatnot. So, if he says things like, you know, I, I wanted a release and all of that, that feels like it ties in more to his character than what's going on in real life. I feel like, uh, you know, Tony Khan and Jack Perry are probably on relatively OK terms and there is a plan to bring him back in the future. Maybe they just don't know when yet. But when you think about it, we're looking at what the end of March here. Forbidden doors right around the corner. So I don't think. I think that'll be the latest we see 
Jack Perry turn back up in AEW. We're only a couple of months away from it here. He will be back in an AEW environment by the time we get to full Forbidden Door, you would think. He's got to be there for Forbidden Door. We'll see what he does there. But that was a funny situation. The Rock stuff was a funny situation. Everybody getting things right, getting things wrong, getting worked, all that stuff's been all over the place. But all I try to do is try to catch the bottom line, and I try not to waste too much time getting stark, raving, head-exploding, red-faced mad at fucking journalists. Don't have time for that in my life. But we will see whenever Jack Perry, Jungle Boy, shows back up in the elite land let me see if that was it mostly for my news i believe that it was right on that should pretty much do it for the rassle news but if there's anything else you guys want to discuss please let me know in the chat we're going to get into smackdown next let me cruise over here to the chat see if i missed any super dupers or anything like that looks like rarely evens chiming in with a few um Luke. Okay. I got that one from Luke. I got that one from rarely. Let's bust out these rarely even fivers here. The first one, did you see how jacked CM Punk looks in his vignettes? Yeah, a little bit, but sometimes he looks jacked in his gym, but then when he gets on TV and he's surrounded by uh, all the wrestlers that are bigger than him, when he comes back to TV on Monday and he's next to Drew McIntyre, he ain't going to look jacked at all. But Punk does look good. I'm glad that, you know, he's my age, you know, so the fact that he's able to keep himself in any, you know, physical shape at all is pretty, pretty impressive. And uh, I appreciate that from him. I just hope when he gets back in the ring, he can have some sort of a run that's lengthy and injury free because... If he comes back and he's back for one match and gets hurt again, I think you have to call it a career. I do. I, I mean, fuck, you know? So I'm I'm really keeping my fingers crossed that when he comes back, he has a good, healthy run and he puts a nice little end and bow on his career and he does not leave loose ends, you know, and doesn't have doesn't leave the business with a, with a bad reputation or with a whole bunch of what ifs or with, with, you know, having to leave because of bad luck or circumstances. I really want CM Punk to have a happy ending. I do. I, I honestly do. Uh, rarely even has got five more. What do you think of Axiom? I think he's the next great masked wrestler. He's electrifying in the ring and he can even talk a little. Haven't gotten a whole big look at him. Uh, even the other guy, Oba Femi or whatever, this gigantic fucker. I'm not, I don't know much about, either guy right now. I don't watch any of NXT. I'm just, I just do not watch that product at all. Uh, aside from a few clips on YouTube, I just wait for everybody to get to the main roster. And I look at them there unless Axiom's already been to the main roster and I've missed him. I don't know. I'm not familiar to be honest. Uh, rarely even appreciate the five. How awesome would it be for Dustin to help Cody at mania? If WWE and AEW can come to some kind of an agreement. We talked about that a couple times recently. I mean, obviously it would be great. Uh, Dustin did, release a social media media video where he said fuck the rock uh dustin was had the rock's first match they were on opposite teams i believe uh in 1996 in that survivor series match where the rock debuted so dustin was a part of the rock's first match they have history and i know i'm sure a one-on-one -on -one match does exist between those two uh more than one probably in wwe Again, that's got to be, you know, a, a Tony Khan thing, WWE. Yeah, can we use Dustin? I mean, for all of the little petty back and forth between the two companies, I think certain arrangements can be made, like, you know, allowing wrestlers to attend a show as long as they're not on camera or, you know, Jericho and, and Big Show sending in uh, video footage for John Cena's appreciation night. Even Jericho doing the Broken Skull Sessions was pretty fucking wild. But having Dustin being right there in the middle of the WrestleMania 20 main event, you, I guess, you know, what do you do? How do you look at that? Do you look at, oh, one of my guys is going to be, you know, visible in the main event of WrestleMania, another company's main event giving me free uh, publicity. But is it really giving AEW free publicity? I mean, a lot of people are going to think it's awesome that Dustin is there. Holy shit, an AEW guy involved in the WrestleMania main event. I, I just don't know. Obviously, my... My belief is, yes, it would be awesome if it happened. I think they should do it. I believe there are certain things that are just bigger than the business in general. And this is somebody's brother. I'll tell you what, man, I'd be really pissed if I was told that I couldn't be there for my sister. You know, if she had some big life event, <laughs> you know, and I happen to work for another company, like you can't go. I'm like, the fucking hell I can't. It's my sister. I'm going. You know, it's my family. Fuck you. 
you know, but at the same time, you know, it's also probably written in your con contract that you cannot be on camera or involved in any other, uh, you know, wrestling uh, promotion. So I just feel like Tony Khan might have to say to Dustin, you can go, but I can't have you at ringside. I can't have you punching the rock. You're gonna have to be up in the box. You can't, you can't be next to Cody's mom because Cody's mom is not Dustin's mom. So I think that Dustin being there, yes, sure. I mean, Sasha and Mercedes, or I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Sasha and Mercedes, Bailey and Naomi and Tamina were at Mercedes AEW debut. Lex Luger, you know, and and some WWE Hall uh, Legends contract guys were at Sting's thing, just not on camera. So I think for sure Dustin could be there. I just don't know if he can be doing anything, you know, and, and again, maybe not getting physical. Obviously they might not want him punching anybody or, or doing anything physical at all, but, and they might want him up in a skybox, not visible. But what if they said, okay, we'll let you, we'll let you be at ringside because you think he would want to hug Cody. You know, I would love for Cody and Dustin to share a hug. I would love that, you know? So again, I don't think, I feel like best case scenario, best case for us would be Dustin being allowed to be at ringside and he gets to hug Cody, but he can't do anything physical. I think the likely scenario, he's going to have to be up in a skybox, not visible. Best case scenario is Tony Khan contacts WWE and says, you have my permission to use Dustin for whatever you want. Have a ball. We're happy for Cody over here. I mean, that'd be the stand-up thing to do. But again, uh, these two kind of, WWE is always taking the the petty road first. You know, they 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 seldom take the high road first. They sometimes do, but they don't. That's not their instinct. Their instinct is to go petty. So I feel like if the situations were reversed, I don't know if WWE would do the same for them. You know, obviously, like what if Sting, you know, wanted shit? I don't even know who's in WWE right now that he has a ton of history with that he could use, but. Let's just say Sting wanted Seth Rollins there or something. They're like, no, are you fucking crazy? No, of course not. So it just it just depends. It's one of those situations where it would be great for the fans, but that's going to be up to WWE and AEW on that one. Uh, five more from Rarely Even. Everyone is complaining that WWE took their time debuting Jade. Now people will complain that she's going to take somebody's spot at Mania. Well, they're always going to complain when it comes to Jade Cargill because that's what people do. Uh, we will talk about Jade here in just a second. And I think that pretty much catches us up. I want to say hello to the Juliet as well, uh, who's in the house. Always good to see you, the Juliet. You better join us tomorrow for WrestleMania 15. Um, Zane G's got 10 bucks. So with that note, on what you said about Dustin, would you say that it's a Kevin Nash that that it's a Kevin Nash not allowed for Sting's match type of situation? No, Kevin Nash is full of shit. Kevin Nash could have gone. Kevin Nash uh, didn't want to. He cited some. He basically said the quiet part out loud. He said he just didn't want to go. And that was the truth. He just didn't want to go. He previously had said that, tried to use his friendship to Triple H. I can't go there and have Kevin Nash's All Elite flashed under my name. They're not going to do that. They're not going to take the time to make you a graphic just because you showed up at Sting's last match. He had the dumbest excuses uh, for that. Uh, Kevin Nash could have been there. Again, I don't think Kevin Nash could have gotten involved. They wouldn't have wanted Kevin Nash, uh, assuming he is under a Legends deal. I think he is. Uh, they wouldn't want Nash on camera. That's all fine. But at the end of the day, Kevin just did not want to go. He is, I, Kevin Nash is just, he's kind of uh, getting sour. He's getting sour. Uh, I, last year at WrestleMania, at WrestleCon, one of the reasons why I didn't meet him was because he looked like he was the most miserable. He's, he was sitting there. Like he wasn't there. His, his mind wasn't there. Just his body was, he was somewhere else. He seemed to look at, not treat, but look at the fans as these nuisances. Oh, I got to take pictures with these fucking assholes today. I just, 
I'm not going to pay him money to meet him. He's got an attitude like that. You know, meanwhile, Sean Waldman, x whose beloved dog just died like two days prior, was there smiling, taking pictures and stuff. And Nash has got a bad eye. He's just getting older, you know? Nash has said tons of times in the past that because of his size and his heart, he doesn't think he's going to live very long. Maybe these things are going on in his head, you know? And he's just kind of, oh, my glory days are over and he just doesn't want to do anything anymore. And sometimes that happens to people. And that's understandable, but he just really seems like he's losing interest in everything and that sucks because i always thought nash was a really really cool dude but i did not believe him zane for a second when he some of the reasons he was concocting for why he couldn't be at sting's last match nash is full of shit anyway but we love nash always love big daddy cool let's talk about last night's smackdown shall we i think that should be a good topic up next um Vitamin Paul, <laughs> yeah, right. Fifle Rocks, they they just do a good job of sourcing out and, and vetting their stuff. And we talk about news here on the podcast a lot. It's my job, you know, so they're just kind of like my go-to. Like, I trust their work. If they ever give me reason not to trust them, then I won't. But I think a lot of fans get caught up in a lot of that that just kind of blind, crazy hate. Oh, they're a fucking joke. I'm like, Fightville does great business. They have umpteen thousand fucking Patreon subscri subscribers. Everybody in the business likes Sean. You know, you never hear any wrestlers coming out and yelling at him for the thigh rubbing and all that fucking night. This is all just from the crazies. It's the same, it's the same fuel that drives the AEW and Tony Khan hate. It's just batshit. It's completely fucking batshit. When you really get down to it and you just put all that out of your mind and you just fucking read words, they do good work. And I've never been disappointed, misled, misinformed in any way by anything they've ever done. And I do this for a living. So what the fuck are the Johnny Ass boys, you know, with 56 followers bitching about? I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense to me. So uh, just read, use your head, be smart. It's not hard. Shouldn't be hard, but for some it is. Let's talk about Smacky. Smacky's from last night was, like I said, kind of underwhelming. We had the main event segment, which we were hoping for more from. The rest of the show, I'm not going to go in order here. We're just going to talk about the key parts of SmackDown because I think of the three shows this week, Raw, Dynamite, and SmackDown, SmackDown was the weakest. Uh, but like I said, they dropped some big news. Jade Cargill will be debuting next week, and we've already seen Braun Breaker on TV, and both of them had video packages, so they're kind of introducing them to us now. Jade getting a video package is perfect. We're now getting a debut date for her, which is next week, which is weird because she's already kind of been hanging around backstage. She's, she's had some interactions with some other wrestlers already, and it felt pretty clear she was going to be on SmackDown, but now she's going to be officially debuting next week. So if they're debuting her before WrestleMania, wouldn't that tell you that she's going to have a match at WrestleMania? That's what my brain tells me, because if she wasn't, why would, wouldn't they just wait until after? Because usually, there's usually a WrestleMania lull. So have a reason to, for people to tune into your show. First SmackDown after WrestleMania, Jade Cargill debut, something like that. But no, they're debuting her ahead of WrestleMania. So that means something's going to happen next week, I think, that's going to, and granted, I think they'll have one more SmackDown. How many more SmackDowns do we have left? Two or three. So she could do it the next week as well, but I feel like groundwork should be laid next week for her to get some last-minute WrestleMania match. And, the, and the, the damage control are sitting right there. We had speculated about the Kabukis a couple of months ago, even right after WrestleMania, or I'm sorry, right after the Rumble when Bianca and Jade had that confrontation. And I think even in the review that night, I said, okay, what do they do at WrestleMania? Do they have a match or are they partners? And we could see them becoming partners. Last night on SmackDown, Bianca and Naomi were getting beat down by damage control, right? So next week, Jade could debut. Maybe her debut match is fucking against Dakota or something. I don't know. And uh, nope, that, that's too much hotness for one match. You can't do that match. I don't even think I'd be able to handle it. But if it was Dakota or something, you could set that up right there. And then Kabuki's jump in and then Bianca and Naomi out for the save. And uh, oh, what a match that would be. The Kabuki's and Dakota <laughs> against those three badasses, Bianca and Naomi and uh, Jade. Holy crap. Again, there would be no title on the line, but maybe that would be just a fun you know, a fun showcase for black women. 
honestly, you know, Bianca and Naomi and Jade sharing that moment together, you know, it would be a six woman. So there would be no title on the line, which means the Kabukis could keep the belts and EO could still drop hers to Bailey. Because one of the things I said a couple of days ago or a couple of podcasts ago, when we talked about the possibility of the Kabukis defending against like Bianca and a partner or even Bianca and Jade, I said, the only problem with that is I feel like Bailey's kind of got to beat EO Sky and I can't see all of Damage Control losing their championships. Well, if you do the the three-way, or the, I'm sorry, the six-woman, then Jade, Bianca, and Naomi could win. And then, of course, since it's a six-woman match, no titles are on the line. It's a bad day for Damage Control, but in the end, they still got a couple of championships with them. You know, oh, because, I mean, we talked about the possibility of Jade and Bianca teaming up to take on the Kabukis. Don't get me wrong, the visual of Jade Cargill and Bianca winning tag team gold together would be incredible. But those titles are weak, and that division is weak. And that team, honestly, would be too fucking strong. They'd be too... Who's going to beat them? Caden and the other one? <laughs> Come on. Your fucking Katana Chance is going to take down Bianca Belair. Get the fuck out of here. So I almost feel like they can't be tag team champions because they would just be too fucking badass. So... It would be like the brothers of Dest- it would be like the brothers of destruction, Kane and the Undertaker winning the tag team titles in 1995 when their competition is uh, well done, the Bushwhackers, Skip and Zip. Yeah, imagine that's what Jade and Bianca winning the titles right now would be like. So doing a six woman eliminates that. Now you don't have to put the titles on Jade and Bianca because when you do that, you have to start thinking about how to take it off of them. And, you know, that could create more problems. You just do a match. Just a fucking match last year. Remember? Wasn't it the six? What was it? It was Trish and Lita. Not a, what, Trish and who the fuck was it? It was Trish and Becky. Was that a six woman or just a tag? That's what I envision for the women this year. Whatever Trish and Becky and whoever the hell else was involved in that match. I was there. I don't even remember. Whatever that match was. Um, that's what... That's the position I feel like this match with those ladies would be in. So we will see what Jade does next week. But my suspicion is they just do that. That's what I would do. I mean, think about that visual. Think about Bianca and, and Naomi and Jade just having that celebration together. Bianca in the middle. She's had, this will add to Bianca's WrestleMania legacy. She already has a tremendous track record there. You know, she's not in the title picture this year, but she's still going to be in a match that's very memorable. You know, I, I just think that a victorious Naomi, Bianca, and Jade standing in the middle of a WrestleMania ring, sharing that moment together would be good for the business. I'm kind of hoping they do it. We'll see. We'll see if I'm right with my aim on that. But Jade will be debuting next week. And if I'm not mistaken, it is a wrestling match, right? We will see what happens. By the way, uh, shout out and happy 70th birthday to Elizabeth's mom. We had a party for her in the park today. Uh, and this is a little leftover water from there. Anyway, cheers. On SmackDown last night, we had Santos Escobar taking on Rey Mysterio. Now, this match was set up last week, and that surprised me because I always thought this match was going to be at WrestleMania. But maybe part of the reason why it's not at WrestleMania is because the first time, I think, ever, I'm starting to see Rey Mysterio is old. I have been blown away by his ability to not age for his, you know, I think just with the mask and the contacts and the fact that he keeps himself in good shape, he just has not really changed that much over the years. And even though he's quite old now, he still performs at a high level. And I think last night, I felt like he's starting to look a little old. And maybe he's not completely fully recovered from that injury. And also, he's just old and it's taken its toll on him. So, they might have decided that this match isn't going to be at WrestleMania. It would be best to make this a multi-man thing. So I thought we were either going to see something happen and we were going to get a rematch, or you know maybe the match wouldn't happen at all and then they book it for Mania. But instead, we did get the match. Dominic Mysterio showed up on the outside of the ring in a mask to distract Ray. So this kind of came out of nowhere. And then Santos comes in and hits him with a 619 and a Phantom Driver for the win. And now... I feel like we might get a match with Dominic and Ray again at WrestleMania, but this time it just might be like a tag team thing. So Dominic might team up with 
uh, Santos and like Phantasma, or maybe it's just a tag. If they advance all the way to, I don't even know who's left in this ladder match, but if Legato del Phantasma does make it in the ladder match, then it might just be like Santos and Dom against Ray and Carlito or something. Is that what they're going to do? I don't know, but it feels like some sort of match like that is going to happen at WrestleMania. And Dominic might get pinned by his son at that show. We will see what that leads to. And I might be wrong about that, but that's just kind of like what it feels like to me. We also saw EO Sky defeat Naomi. Now, Asuka and uh, Kyrie Sane ran in to distract Naomi. That allowed EO Sky to capitalize and win the match. So Naomi dropped another one, but she did get robbed. There was then a post-match beatdown on Naomi. Bianca comes out, and my God, this was so good. This just, I thought, as I'm casually watching it here, is just going to be your typical run-in. Bianca's going to run in and, you know, kick a little butt, and everybody's going to run away. She kicked a lot of butt. Holy shit. She comes sprinting out there and she just lays waste to everyone. And it's, it's, I always talk about those moments that if I was a non wrestling fan and I was watching, I'd be impressed by. And I thought about last night, SmackDown being on Fox. I think about people channel surfing. And if they happen to click on, if they're a non wrestling fan and they landed on Fox right at the same time Bianca was running in, there's no way they turned away at least for the next few seconds, because she was beating the fuck out of them. And it was so fucking badass. But eventually the heels numbers game caught up to Bianca. They regained control and they beat down Bianca and Naomi. Naomi trying to cover Bianca to protect her and all that. So the fact that they got beat down there, you know, by four women, one of those women is going to have a championship match at WrestleMania, leaving three of them against the two of them. And we got Jade debuting next week. I'm just kind of adding two and two here. Carry the one. I got four. What'd y'all get? Two and another two. According to my math, feels like there's a big possibility for that nice six-woman scenario that I just laid out to actually happen. We'll see. Like I said, those dumbass qualifying matches are going on right now, and it just feels overly convoluted and unnecessary just to get to these six teams. And I've kind of lost track of who's in and who's not. So last night, it was Theory and Waller defeating the Good Brothers. They will advance to, I believe, take on the Street Profits next week, who defeated the Authors of Pain to advance. So Waller and the Streets either face next week to qualify or are both qualified. I don't even know. Uh, I don't even give a shit. I'm just ready for the match to be complete and ready. And it sounds like there could be an opportunity for a mystery team in that. Maybe it could be the Dudley Boys. Who knows? Maybe not. Probably not. Uh, oh, my God. L.A. Knight uh, went to A.J. Styles' house in Georgia, took that midnight train. And A.J., they're like, uh, they're kind of filming him shooting an interview in his house or, sh or filming some content for some project. And there's a horn honking out and outside. And A.J.'s like, what the fuck, man? He's honking a horn, man. And he gets up and he storms outside. And L.A. Knight's standing next to his car and he's got his hand in the window going yeah i told you i'd come to your house just just like austin uh very reminiscent of austin and pillman just no gun and uh he attacks aj they start brawling in the yard the camera the camera feed is lost i always wondered how uh well i guess kevin kelly was there interviewing pillman so they had an excuse for the cameras being there with pillman uh i don't and i guess the uh, the documentary crew, di uh, the documenting crew being there was the excuse to have the camera crew here to film this, but they conveniently like drop the camera or lose the feed right when the brawl starts. It, when they come back, uh, the cops are there now. They're arresting L.A. Knight and he's like, WrestleMania is coming. So L.A. Knight went all the way to his house in true Austin fashion uh, to attack. So. It was just the right amount of stupid. I like it. I like that pro wrestling stuff. Like it was absurd, obviously, but there are some segments like this that you almost appreciate the absurdity of it. You know, Suggs, there's just a line. There's just kind of like an invisible, undefined line that you can cross over to something being overly cringy, you know, or being the wrong kind of cringy. And there's also the good kind of cringy. And the fact that LA Knight went to his house, you know, and AJ just happened to be filming some stuff and the cameras were there and they caught it all. The absurdity is what makes it great. And I actually liked it. So I didn't have any problem with uh, uh, LA Knight showing up at uh, at the Styles household at all. It'd been funny if he blunt force trauma one of his little kids or maybe, uh, what's her name? 
Wendy. I, I know I will always know AJ Styles' wife name, wife's name because of Samoa Joe. It's because of him. All I have to think about, if I can't remember her name, I think about Joe saying it, and then I remember instantly, Wendy. So that was fun. And the only other thing really notable on SmackDown last night was, of course, the main event segment and the fact that this was the main event, not the opening promo. This was set up to be more of like an, a show opener than a closer because we saw like no physicality. So it was the big Cody and Roman confrontation. They set this up last week. There was going to be no rock here on the show. And Cody and Roman were finally going to have some time, some alone time together, a little date night for the two of them, because all the kids have been driving them crazy and they haven't had a chance to really look each other in the eye. So they are going to do that here on SmackDown. Uh, Roman comes out first and then says a few words, of course, and then Cody comes out. And just a lot of underwhelming stuff. Uh, Roman brings up uh, Cody not being able to trust Seth, questioning whether or not he can trust Seth. And Roman is right. Roman brought up good points there. He said, yo, me and Seth were about as close as you could be without being brothers, you know, a brotherhood in that shield, you know, and he turned on me. He, you know, it was Seth that turned that night on everybody and hit Roman with the chair. And if he did that to me, imagine what he would do to you type of thing. And then Cody, this is where I feel like they kind of, they, they lost an opportunity here is because Cody turns this around on him and says something that a lot of us have been wondering ourselves in terms of The Rock perhaps being a double agent, doing the this thing. A few moments between him and Roman have felt tense even after the WrestleMania Vegas uh, kickoff thing. And you can tell that we're going to be getting that match after WrestleMania, either next year or maybe even like a Saudi Arabia thing or something. So you knew, we know as fans that that's coming. So the fact that Cody brought this up and Rock and Roman kind of no sold it a little bit. You know, Roman, I was hoping to see him get a little bothered by that, maybe get a little mad, a little heated, yell at Cody, you don't know what you're fucking talking about or whatever. Just get agitated, you know, show that he is threatened by Rock being there. And there are some problems that the fans aren't completely seeing. And that's probably going to come to light in WrestleMania. We didn't get any of that. Rock, Roman just no sold it in his typical Roman way, that smirk that he does or that laugh or whatever, you know, and just didn't react the way I was hoping he would, you know, especially when Cody is saying things like, you know, who, who's the final word? Is it the final boss or is it the tribal chief? Who's really in charge? You know, bringing all of that up and Roman not biting on it was kind of disappointing. So that was like disappointment number one. Uh, disappointment number two, I think, is that we just didn't have, you know, any physicality. And then Roman reminded Cody of his belief that Cody is the greatest number two of all time. The reason he's not the greatest number one of all time is because Roman's number one. And Cody can't be number one if Roman's number one. So he's the greatest number two of all time. Even Cody goes for a handshake at the end, wants to shake Roman's hand, which I don't believe he should at this point. I feel like Cody, you know, has already said that he was going to be hunting the bloodline and whatever. And I wanted a little bit more of an aggressive Cody pretty much in every interaction with any bloodline member that he has. Even with Paul Heyman last week, he was like, don't. You better ask permission before you get in this ring, fatso. And I like that. And the fact that he was not more, you know, kind of like in a fearless, in-your-face mindset at WrestleMania or with Roman Reigns about WrestleMania was just a little bit, I think, disappointing to me. So when Cody went to shake his hand, I'm like, you should bitch slap him, you know? And then Roman doesn't shake his hand, and then he leaves and then again, they kind of tease you with something kind of cool. Jimmy and Solo Sokoa start coming through the crowd. And then Cody's looking around. Oh, fuck. But Cody's not stupid. After they get there and kind of surround Cody and threaten him, Jey Uso and Seth Rollins show up. And the whole show ends kind of with a face-off, you know, with the, with the six of them. And what I would do if I'm WWE is I'd bring back an old favorite. They're not going to do this because they're just not going to do this. <laughs> they're not. So what I'm about to say here is not going to happen. But back in the day, WWE on the go home WrestleMania Raws have had some big, massive matches. And I think it would be a fun six man, you know, Cody, Seth, Jay, Roman, Jimmy, Solo, like six man main event on Raw, go home Raw. They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. They're not going to put Cody and Roman in the ring on fucking Raw before WrestleMania. It's not what they do anymore. 
But it sure would be cool if they did something like that. Maybe it could be Cody and Seth having a tune-up. You know, against Solo and Jimmy, but then you'd think that Jay would want to get involved in that. Yeah, they're probably not going to do anything. No, None of those guys are going to have any matches with each other before WrestleMania. But back in the day, they used to set up really fun matches. Didn't like It wasn't like the NWO against Rock and Austin one year. Like, crazy stuff. So, because I believe, right? I think Rock and, and Hogan were in the ring prior to WrestleMania 18, I think. Pretty sure that match happened before. So we saw them interact before we saw them interact. So, I mean, in theory, there's nothing wrong with them doing the match I proposed. It's just not something that Roman is going to do, wrestling a TV match on Raw. Roman is the new Brock, and I just don't think he's going to be doing that. And that was pretty much our SmackDown in a nutshell. Now, like I said about Cody and Roman, I think that there is plenty of time to turn the corner here. I feel like this is one segment that was underwhelming. This was one segment that I wished would have gone a little bit differently, but it's not enough to make me think that this match is going to suck now. It's not enough to make me think this is this shit's in the mud or it's lost its steam or anything like that. This can be recovered from. All you got to do, luckily for you guys, you have more weeks ahead of you of TV before we get to WrestleMania. All you got to do, all you got to do is make the next one better. Unless, unless this was intended on being the last time Cody and Roman are in the ring until WrestleMania. It better not be. We still need a contract signing, I think, maybe. Uh, I mean, if Sammy and Gunther sign one, why wouldn't Cody and Roman sign one? Uh, and may, The four of them might need a contract signing, so I'm hoping maybe we get something like that. But the next time there's a Cody and Roman in the ring, or even The Rock or whoever the fuck is there, it just needs to be a little bit better than this. And it makes you wonder, you know... I put on the thumbnail, you know, is The Rock overshadowing Cody and Roman? You know, maybe a little bit. I think The Rock is a tremendous entertainer, but The Rock has really made this entire fucking weekend about himself. You know, he originally was going to get the match against Roman Reigns on night two. Now he's going to be involved in both main events. Now, not only he's getting his WrestleMania main event, just not on the night he thought. He's going to get it on night one in a tag, but... I'm expecting his team to win that night. I'm expecting night two to be bloodline rules. And I'm expecting the rock to be all fucking over that main event. He's going to be all over the hall of fame. because His grandma's going in. He's got family going in there. The whole weekend has been accentuated by the rock. It feels like this is the rocks. WrestleMania, not Cody's, not Romans. And part of that really isn't anybody's fault. The Rock is a charismatic icon. The Rock commands so much fucking energy. He is so over the top, you know, just with his persona and the presence that he has, that he's just going to steal the spotlight again away from anybody. You know, but what I do find a little bit disappointing about this whole situation, as much as I do like seeing The Rock back, it might be a little bit of overkill because Roman Reigns had this he had this aura and this vibe to me of being a true main eventer. He came off like a big deal. This is because of WWE and how they've used him over the past couple of years, turning him heel, working the light schedule, not defending the title as much, kind of kind of presented like a prize fighter, like a big money marquee, uh, you know, headlining fighter type of thing who only comes out for the big shows. And when he's on TV, you know, everybody pays attention. If Roman is going to be on SmackDown this week, we're going to have a lot to talk about because he's going to be out there and you could feel it. He felt like a big star. And that was the vibe and aura that he had. And I was happy that because I didn't think it was even possible for WWE to build someone to this level in the in this modern era. And he just always came off like such a mega super fucking star. Once he turned heel, I'm talking not not suffering succotash Roman, but you know modern heel white teeth Roman. He's been tremendous, and I've loved just the the aura and the vibe he has that does rival someone like a Brock Lesnar. It's the same type of thing. They've done a great job of establishing him as that, and some of the matches he's had over the past year has had so much drama and story in them, where he just really feels like he's the center of everything that goes on in this company. And the minute Ro The Rock comes back, you almost fucking forget about him. Think about the four players here. Rock, Roman, Cody, Seth. How would you rank them? How would you rank them in order of importance? I almost think it's Rock, Cody, Roman, Seth. Roman's number three now. He, you know, I feel like he's been 
such a large shadow has been cast over him. This this aura of what I felt Roman was over the past couple of years feels like it's not even there because the rock's energy is so bright, you know, and I don't even know really if that's a good or a bad thing from a fan's perspective, you know, uh, Roman and Cody, what I, as much as I love the heel rock back, I love his heel persona. I love that he's being a dick bag and I love that, you know, he's trying his best to make this WrestleMania memorable one. And I really f still feel like it will be. I can't help but think about one of the things I said right from the very beginning, at the beginning of the year, when we started talking about The Rock way before we even knew he was going to come back much less turn heel. We talked about if he was even necessary. And this whole year, you know, Cody and Roman, it's not the same thing, but Cody and Roman kind of had the vibe that Savage and Hogan did between WrestleMania 4 and WrestleMania 5. It's that you just kind of knew that was the match you were going to get. You know, and both guys were on this road and you, you knew eventually those roads were going to intersect one more time at WrestleMania. And, you know, this time it was going to be different. And the strength of that main event, if Rock would have never came back and stuck his fucking people's eyebrow into our business, this would have been so creatively satisfying for me as a fan. I would have been perfectly engaged and happy with a Cody Rhodes, Roman Reigns, night one main event. I'm sorry, night two main event. I would have been perfectly happy with Seth and CM Punk or Seth and McIntyre, whatever they would have done there. I feel like Gunther, you know, another big match on the show. I didn't need The Rock to be a part of this. He came in, fucked everything up, pissed us all off for a couple of weeks, but then they kind of rectified it, went in this new direction that I actually liked, and it calmed me. And now I'm happy about WrestleMania again. But here now we're getting to a, a night two main event, the most important match on the entire two night card or what should be. And it's not feeling like it. So they got to get this right. They have to the next time make you care again and remind the fans, you know, how much they've all wanted to see Cody achieve this story. I mean, I, I don't think so because I just don't think WWE would be in this business now of doing this, but I just really hope there's not some sort of behind the scenes animosity or some sabotaging of Cody going on because Rock or somebody might be upset about how they didn't get their match. I'm just pure, wild, baseless speculation. I'm just wondering these things out loud. I just really hope that Rock or Triple H or somebody isn't resentful for Cody and how the fans want him. And now they're going to try to, you know, maybe sabotage his run. I felt like they kind of did that to Daniel Bryan. Like once he won the title, granted he got hurt, but like his first feud was with Kane. And I'm like, oh God, I feel like it's just going to be another Eddie or Benoit run is all this is going to be. Because when Eddie and Benoit won the titles, they just held him for a couple of months. They each had like a five month run, four month run, something like that. Short, short as shit. And Brian, had he not gotten injured in 2014, might have dropped the title by SummerSlam anyway. So I, I really hope that Cody's situation isn't, here, let's give you your fucking title and your story. Here you go. And then take it off him a few months later. I think if Cody is belted up here, he needs to be Cena. You know, he needs to be the baby face or the, the face of the company, the guy that does the appearances and the touching the kissing the babies and the make a wish. He needs to be Cena for a while, and it needs to be longer than four months. And I think he needs to carry the title into the following year's WrestleMania and drop it to Seth. That's what I would do. But I'm hoping that they can get things back on track, and the next time these guys are in the ring, it's way more exciting than it was last night because that was a little bit of a letdown. I'm not going to lie. This Monday, though, should be interesting. By the way, we're going to be here reviewing Monday Night Raw immediately following the show. The link to this live stream is already up on the channel, so you can go over there, find it. Should be right at the top of the page. And set your notification for this Monday because CM Punk will be making his return. And there's been a lot of talk about CM Punk this week and his involvement in WrestleMania. It sounds like he's going to be involved, and I think that's great. I mean, it's just an arm. He can walk, so he can be there. He can do stuff. They ran a video package or a little vignette for Punk this past Monday, where he alluded to being at WrestleMania, whether he's invited or not. And Drew McIntyre has been trolling the shit out of Punk for weeks now. And then there's the, the most recent uh, social media video of McIntyre working out while Cry Me a River is playing. Trust me, I adore Drew McIntyre's trolling. I think it's just top tier shit. I'm loving every second of it. 
But man, he's making it a bit obvious at this point with each one of these trolls, the more his chances of winning the title in my mind go down. I feel like Punk is going to cost Drew McIntyre. I feel like that's the only thing you can do at this point. I also feel like there is a possibility that Punk could be the referee. He's going to be on Raw this Monday. Why is he on Raw? You would think that Punk as his character is going to come on Raw to find a way into WrestleMania. I don't know if Adam Pearce is just going to flat out give him a guest referee role in this match because he's going to say, well, you're going to fuck over McIntyre. And then Punk can, well, maybe Punk can be like, well, why would I do that? I have issues with Seth too. We've, we, I've got issues with both of these guys. We've both had words with each other. You know, McIntyre, his issue is a little more uh, important because he actually stomped my arm and hurt me. So it might be hard to justify in storyline why he would be allowed to referee the match, but maybe he sets up a day. Hey, you, you, Drew, you face this guy, and if you lose, then Punk's the referee or something like that. I don't know. Or maybe Punk just gets himself at ringside guest commentator. I don't know. Uh, or he just flat out runs in. We will see. He might come out on Raw on Monday and just say, hey, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. All I can tell you guys is that I'm going to be at WrestleMania. And then he just announces that he's going to be there because I don't think there's any reason to hide CM Punk and then have him come through the crowd in a hood. You know, you can he can announce that he's going to be there. And then if he were to make an appearance or distract McIntyre or cost McIntyre the match, possibly even unintentionally costing Punk. Either way, I think Punk, or I'm sorry, costing uh, Seth, unintentionally causing, costing Seth the title is something that Punk could do. Either way, I think Punk's involvement is almost a done deal at this point in the McIntyre and Rollins match. And like we laid out on Monday, in a bunch of different scenarios, you can't rule out Damian Priest. Because Damian Priest has got the briefcase, and like I said on Monday, this guy's essentially going to have four opportunities to cash that thing in. Night one, there's going to be a tag team match with both champions in the ring. And then on night two, both champions are defending their titles. So in all these little group meetings that Judgment Day has, how is Rhea Ripley not nudging Damian Priest? Bro, brother, mania. Mania is your night. You you know, you got all these champions here, both nights, vulnerable, doing shit, potentially injured. This is your night. So think about that from a character perspective. If WWE creatively doesn't have plans, I've talked about this before. This is why WWE did a good job at Saudi Arabia having Sammy like steal the briefcase in the other night, that other time when Rhea Ripley scolded Damian Priest and took the briefcase away from him and put him in timeout. You know, they've done things to kind of explain why Priest isn't able to cash in. So at WrestleMania, if he, if WWE creatively has no plans for Damian Priest to cash in that briefcase, then they better give us a reason as to why he's not taking advantage of what is going to be multiple situations of Seth and, and Roman being in compromised positions. So is he going to get hurt in the ladder match and, and taken to the hospital? Uh, is he going to forget about the briefcase? And if they retain in that ladder match, they just go off to celebrate and he just leaves the show. Like, I feel like there's no way the Damien Priest character can be backstage uninjured with Roman and Seth both down and out several times over the course of two nights. And you don't take advantage of that. You don't jump and leap on the opportunity to win the championship at the biggest WrestleMania you guys have had so far. The 40th one, a milestone show like this with Damian Priest celebrating with the title. Why would he not take advantage of that? Why would that not be Damian Priest's number one fucking goal right now? So he's going to look stupid as hell if he doesn't at least attempt to cash the briefcase in. I think one way or the other, he's got to at least attempt it. Maybe he attempts it and loses. You know, and I, I also talked about a crazy scenario at the end of night two. Let's say Rollins retains. Rollins retains. Punk costs Drew the match. Rollins retains on night two. Cody wins the, the title from Roman in the main event. And Seth and Cody do the Eddie and Benoit moment from WrestleMania 20. Seth and Cody celebrate both with the world championships. And then Damian Priest comes out. And then they're standing there 
looking at each other. What the fuck is he going to do? Which one's he coming after? You know, and then one of them could attack the other and save themselves. They could do something bonkers if they want to do. But whatever they do, just from a creative standpoint, they better explain uh, Damian Priest not cashing in if he doesn't cash in. Otherwise, you're going to wonder what he's never going to have a better opportunity than this. This is the best opportunity Priest could ever have. That's the whole point of having the briefcase, right? Waiting for the best opportunity. How can you have a better opportunity than having four chances over the course of a weekend to win the championship? <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. So look for that at WrestleMania. Something is going to be reconciled with senior money in the bank. It absolutely has to. The story dictates it has to happen. That's the way I look at it anyway. And like I said, unless there's a kayfabe injury that knocks him out, there should be nothing stopping him at WrestleMania, ladder match or no ladder match. All right, uh, that leaves us with Dynamite. Let me go back to uh, the chat here and see how everybody is doing. I got a couple of more Super Chats to answer. If anybody has not smashed that thumbs up button for me, if you'd like to do that, I'd be appreciative. And I do owe some Super Chats. So let's do that real quick. And then we will talk about what I thought was a really fun AEW Dynamite this week. Uh, Mike Witt has got five for us. Cross and AOP versus Bobby and the Prophets is what I want. Make it a Philly street fight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If Cody loses again, Philly fans are going to lose their mind. You know, that reminds me of what I think Cross and AOP should do is what LOD and the nation did at WrestleMania 13. It was that Chicago street fight, right? That's what it's got to be. You're absolutely right, Mike. I am right on board with that because I know they were doing the thing backstage with Scarlet and Cross and that whole thing is still going on. That's definitely what they're going to do. Philly street fight, Cross and AOP versus Bobby and the Prophets. I'm into that. I'm into that for sure. Oh, Juliet, did I say Dom gets pinned by his son? Get Ray gets pinned by his son. My mind's all over the place. It's been a busy day, Juliet. Mike Witz, two more. Thanks again, dude. At least AJ didn't pull a Glock out like Pillman. Yeah, that would have been that would have been funny. Fucking Georgia, man. Country boys, you got to watch out for them. Mike Witt, two more. I still think Cena does a run-in on night two. Uh, Cena being involved. I don't even know if he'd do a run-in. I think they'd want to have him out there doing something uh, or bring him out as a surprise. I still think this WrestleMania does need something similar to what we got at WrestleMania 30. It doesn't have to be the exact same thing. But at WrestleMania 30, we got Hogan and Austin and Rock doing that little toast. And I would love like a super extended version of that. What if you brought out Brett and Sean and Austin and Cena and Foley? Maybe even Triple H. You know, he's busy, but maybe even Triple H. Maybe even The Rock. He's also busy. But imagine if you have Rock, Triple H, and Austin, and Foley, and Undertaker, and Sean, and Brett and Cena. All these guys are alive. All these guys are on good terms with WWE, relatively. Uh, and hell, maybe you can chuck another one in there. But those are all pretty big icons uh, that you could maybe do some sort of fun thing with. Now, if Vince wasn't such a dirty son of a bitch and he would have lived his life like a normal human being and not like a disgusting fucking pervert, rapist, asshole, then he could be out there too for this. Uh, maybe some more McMahons could be out there for this since Vince kind of started the whole WrestleMania thing, but some sort of a, a gathering, you know, uh, if you will, of former icons doing some sort of welcome or celebration, maybe even mixed in with a current star or something. I don't know. I think would be really fun. And if you opened up the show with something like that, it would be great. Or perhaps have that be one of those middle of the show type of deals like we did at 32 where, Sean and Austin and Foley came out and beat up the League of Nations, you know, something where Rock and Cena, you know, teamed up, smacked around the Wyatt family at 32 when Rock beat Eric Rowan. Something like that, I think, would be fun, you know, involving some legends where you just have a moment and you acknowledge and commemorate uh, that this is the 40th one of these things. And that's just that's just mind blowing to me. First one I bought on pay-per-view was WrestleMania four. So this will be my 36th uh, WrestleMania that I've watched uh, on pay-per-view or whatever they use these days. It's crazy. It's fucking crazy. So I'm hoping we do get something Cena related at WrestleMania, but it also depends on his movie schedule. Don't even know if he can get in the ring, if he can take bumps. There was a report that he couldn't. So I'm not sure if a run-in would work, but an in-ring segment or love fest might be kind of fun. 
uh, rarely even has five for us. Apparently, Cena, Austin, and Taker are in play for Mania. How would you use each one? Well, I just told you, <laughs> rarely even. So perfect timing on that question because I would put them all in the ring together and give the fans a visual. All these guys are super old. So, you know, get them while you can and, and get them all in there. I just think it might be nice. Something like they did at WrestleMania 30, maybe just an expanded version of that would be pretty nice. Um, all right, I caught up uh, everything there. Man, I was there last year to watch Shane tear that quad i could see it from my seat as soon as he did it like i have footage i have like two hours of footage of wrestlemania and you can hear me going that's legit like it was instant the middle the minute he crumpled even from way up where i was sitting i could tell that he hurt himself for real and that was rough that was rough i don't think we're gonna see shane this year i just think the mcmahon name should stay the fuck away at least for a little while anyway um Let's talk about this past week's Dynamite. Again, we're not. We're going to kind of treat this like SmackDown. We're not going to talk about everything. We're going to talk about a couple of things, and we will talk about Mercedes Monet. Now, Mercedes Monet made her debut at Big Business the previous week. Now she's back to open up the show here for a little bit more of a welcoming welcoming promo. Now that she did everything last week, now that she now she needs to kind of get down to business. So she talks about being happy to be in AEW and how it was almost taken away from her due to her injury that she suffered after she left uh, WWE. And then she showed a video package. Here's a, I want to show you guys a video package that I put together. And um, it was well done. You know, shows a lot of what she's done so far since leaving WWE and prior to coming to AEW. And it was really well produced. And when they come back to the uh, the ring, she says that small setbacks make great comebacks. And she's here to face the best and continue this uh this revolution or whatever they're calling it in the AEW women's division. And she said, and the funniest part was when she delivers the something to the effect of there's a price to pay when you mess with Mercedes Monet, but she's not looking at the camera. It's so frustrating. I'm like, she's looking at the hard cam, but there's a cameraman in the ring standing right next to her. And I'm like, girl, the cam- I don't know if they use the red light in AEW like they do everywhere else, but fuck, how do you not see that right there? That You deliver that line into the camera. That's what you do. How do you not know that? <laughs> so uh, <coughs> that was like watching her say that. I'm like, look in the camera, look in the camera, look in the camera. I'm like, what the fuck? And she didn't look in the camera. So I feel like that line could have been delivered better. But then the lights went out. Lights went out. Sky Blue was then in the ring. Uh, Mercedes drops her like third period French. And then Sky and Julia Hart get uh, a pair of chairs. And they're about to attack Mercedes with chairs. And that's when Statlander and Willow come out to make the save. The lights go out again and Julia and Sky are gone. And Willow's got the chair. Mercedes has her back turned. And she's kind of thinking about hitting her. Willow's too sweet. She can't pretend to be morally conflicted you know she wasn't doing a good job of acting like she wasn't sure what to do uh i think it's just because she's too nice but mercedes mercedes turns around sees willow with the chair she's like what the fuck man she leaves all mad like come on you're gonna fucking hit me are you kidding me she's all pissed off so i feel like we got to get mercedes and willow at at uh dynasty backstage they did a little thing backstage where uh Mercedes and Willow had a few more words. Uh, Malcolm uh, Bivens <laughs> showed up. Stokely uh, showed up to kind of introduce himself to uh, Sa- or to Mercedes. I can't remember what company these guys work for. And she ends up like walking away. So I feel like eventually they'll get there. We got a couple of more weeks, but they'll make Mercedes and uh, Willow for Dynasty. Here's a match I thought was going to be on Dynasty, but it was on Dynamite. It was Okada versus Eddie Kingston. So Eddie is putting up his Continental Championship uh, on Dynamite against uh, Kazuchika Okada, not at Dynasty. So we got that on Wednesday, and it was pretty quick after all that, after the tournament and that run of Eddie's, Okada just puts him down, smacks him like a bitch, Rainmaker for the win. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like a squash or anything. Eddie had his moments in there, but it felt like Their chemistry wasn't even that great, and maybe that's why they didn't want to put this match on the pay-per-view. And if the plan was to put the belt on Okada and have it take him from have him take it from Kingston, then just do it on TV. That felt like what their uh what the point there was. And uh after he wins, he's then confronted on the stage. They're wasting no time. 
by Pac. So Pac comes out, doesn't come to the ring, just stands on the stage, kind of stares down Okada, and it feels like it's going to be Okada and Pac for that Continental Championship at Dynasty. And I like that match better, to be honest. I like Eddie Kingston and everything, but there's, you know, there's there's, there's a limit to his in-ring work that I can take. But I do like him as a character. I love the way the fans get behind him. Uh, and I love his, uh, his passion and how seriously he takes being a pro wrestler. There's a lot about Eddie Kingston to like, uh, so I'm not going to shit on his ring work too much. I think people are assholes who do that. Uh, but you can't deny that Pac and Okada is going to be a much better in-ring match to watch than Okada and Kingston would have been. And Okada is now the new Continental Champion. So we'll see how many more belts they add to the Elite because the Bucks are in that tag team tournament and I'm convinced that they're going to win that. So Elite is going to be draped in gold in just a matter of weeks, it feels like. Uh, Hook defeated Chris Jericho. That Chris Jericho, isn't he great? Just continues to give the rub to all them young guys, passing on that knowledge, you know, just touching Jericho makes you smarter. And so he's been able to work with so many young guys and give them that 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 priceless rub that only Jericho can give you. What a great, I'm kidding. This whole fucking match was goddamn stupid. I don't even know why Jericho's doing this right now. He's the Lionheart these days. And he's been sticking his nose into Hook's business, approached him. Hey, I want to see what you got as a partner. Oh, now that I see that you're good, I want to see what you got in the ring. And so it's this whole fucking thing. And so this match, Jericho just works in slow motion. You know, he he looks, he, he's old. He's just old. It happens, man. It's okay to be old. Fucking I'm old. So I'm allowed to say that. But he's just old. It's just, you know, he, I thought he was pulling it off, you know, five years ago when AEW started and he was the first AEW champion. And I liked I, I liked a lot of that. And I did like some of the younger talent Jericho worked with, like Orange Cassidy, you know. But when you think about guys like Action Andretti, yeah, he, he beat Jericho. But where did that get Action Andretti? I don't think that's Jericho's fault. I think the intent was to elevate guys. It just didn't result that way. It's probably more on AEW really than it is Jericho. But I think in Jericho's mind, he truly believes that at this point he's given a rub, and I just don't think he is at this point. Uh, I think I think Adam Copeland is, is is more capable at his age than Jericho is right now at his, and this match was just kind of fucking boring and slow motion looking, and Hook did beat him, thank God. But what sucks is it's not over, because after it's over, they fist bump, and then in the back, Renee is interviewing Jericho, and he says he's got a proposition for Hook next week. So please tell me, <laughs> Lord Jesus, baby Jesus, please tell me that Hook doesn't have to beat all the different renditions of Jericho. Like, is he going to be, uh, uh, what's it, not the Rainmaker, Painmaker Jericho? How many Jerichos are there? Uh, there's the Painmaker. Uh, there's like Y2J character. I know there's a few. So what I'm worried here is that not only does this story between Jericho and Hook suck. The matches suck. And now we're going to get more. So this just need Jericho enough, 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 <laughs> enough, you know, just enough of him. Uh, here's a guy I can never get enough of, you know, like the little, you know, the gif, the social media gif where it's like the kid going, <laughs> you know, it's like me whenever I hear Will Ospreay talk, I fucking love this guy. I've been on Team Osprey for about a year now, maybe even longer than that. But I swear it's been a, a solid year plus where I'm like, I love Osprey, I love Osprey, and now that he's in AEW and his promos are just so good, and it felt like it just came out of nowhere overnight. His, his voice, you know, and his just everything, the way he speaks and his cadence, his inflection, his bruv, and all of that. He just comes off like a star, and it almost—I don't want to say it like came out of nowhere, but it's. It's funny how you can see guys grow and evolve so well in their promos. Some guys never get better. Some guys never change. You know, Osprey's a guy who it feel feels like his body and his talent and his charisma has all been following the same path as his because there was like just a five, six years ago, he was skinny prick. You know, now he's filled out, he's bigger, he's got the facial hair, he's got the deep voice, you know, and his work is just spectacular, and his promos are so fun. He's a legitimately fun guy who you, I mean, who you like to hear talk, and these days, 
you know, after watching wrestling for 40 years and seeing every different kind of fucking promo there has been, and to the point where now I tune a lot of promos out. There's just a lot of redundant shit. A lot of wrestlers say the same stuff, and a lot of promos are very formulaic. Even sometimes, regardless of whether it's a, a male performer or a female performer, they follow kind of the same formula a lot of times. And I just tune it out because I don't need to hear somebody say their name and that I am the insert company name world champion. I fucking know. I got two eyes. I can see. Like, what the hell? So a lot of times I don't even listen to promos because I'm not interested. That's not the case with Will Ospreay. I am very interested when he speaks. Sounds like and looks like they're kind of developing a fun little uh, little chemistry there uh, with Skiavone. And he was in Canada, and he apologized for, to Canada for being a naughty boy last time he was here. I forgot what he did, but apparently he was naughty. And he wanted Canada to give him some of that maple syrup. And he talks about his match with uh, Brian Danielson at uh, Dynasty, and he talks about uh, Katsuyora Shibata and the matches he see with him, and he challenges Shibata next week. And just the way he talks, I can just watch this guy talk for an hour because uh, I can't do accents, and so I, I like listening to people with accents. And he's so great. He's the type of guy that just makes me fucking smile when he comes out. And I, when he first came in, prior to him coming in, I was like, I don't think they should be waiting any longer than two years to make this guy champion. I don't even think it should be that long. I'm thinking one. I'm cutting my uh, my my prediction in half there. And I'm saying like within one year. And here's a, a way early prediction, not prediction, but possibility when it comes to Osprey. I am certain, and we're going to talk about Swerve in a minute. I am certain that we're going to get Swerve and Joe and Dynasty. That's what's going to happen. And now I feel like it's time. Revolution was not time for Swerve. That was not going to be his match. If he gets the main event against Joe at Dynasty, that has to be it. So what I would do is I would I would belt Swerve at Dynasty in just a couple of weeks. Swerve is the new AEW champion. He beats Samoa Joe. And I would give him as many successful title defenses as you can between now and all in. <clears throat> meaning he defends successfully at Double or Nothing, then at Forbidden Door, then at whatever the fuck the one in July is, the Fighter Fest or whatever, then maybe even another one, and then you book Swerve and Will Ospreay in the main event of All In in London, and Ospreay beats him for the title. I know that's a quick run for Swerve, but you know what? There's a lot of guys at the top right now, and I think this will only be the first of what will be multiple world title runs for Swerve, hopefully. This is all on Tony Khan. He's got to follow through with shit and not make stupid mistakes like he's done in the past. He just does everything right. Swerve should be fine. You give Swerve, albeit a quick run, but you give him some good title defenses there. You give him a good match at double or nothing, he wins. One at Forbidden Door, he wins. Give him some def successful title defenses where he's looking like a really strong champion. And then it's him and Osprey main event, and you put well, you put Will Osprey over. You just have to, you know. And then Swerve, give him the title back in 2025, no problem. You know, another year from now, maybe. I mean, shit, maybe you could have Osprey hold it a fucking year, and then they have a whole uh, rematch it all in in 2025. But again, I don't think AEW can really have a lot of year long runs in a row. I think MJF had that long one, but. You know, Swerve, obviously, he really needs to be champion probably right now. But then again, you got Osprey at the top. You are going to have MJF coming back. Adam Cole is going to get healthy at some point. And your world title scene will be pretty crowded. And I just don't think you can have guys holding the title in AEW the way Roman Reigns is holding the title in WWE. Just my opinion. So I think that at the end of the day, that might be your more attractive or most attractive all-in match is Osprey beating Swerve for the championship in the main event. My God. So that's just one way I could see things going starting at Dynasty with uh, with Swerve. But man, that Osprey is something else. Shibata, Osprey next week on Dynamite. Should be fun. They had, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Thunder Rosa. And Deanna Parasso uh, defeated Tony Storm and Mariah May. I actually kind of didn't like the finish here because Tony Storm hit Thunder Rosa with one of those just gnarly hip attacks that are so brutal. I mean, they're so brutal. And she damn near took Rosa's head off. But Rosa 
immediately recovered from it because usually after the hip attack, Tony goes into the pile driver and Thunder Rosa reversed it and rolled her up and got a pin on her and then celebrated all happy, like smiling. And I'm like, doesn't your head hurt? <laughs> doesn't your head and neck and back and entire fucking upper body? Uh, shouldn't it be in intense pain right now after your head damn near came clean off your shoulders, not 10 seconds ago from the hip attack. So it just seemed like a really quick recovery. And I'm a big fan of the hip attack move because of how devastating it looks. <clears throat> and in my mind, that should be a finisher. That move looks so good that it should be her finisher. You get hit with that. You should not be able to get up. So I don't know why she needs to go into the pile driver thing. Just hit him with the hip attack, drag your opponent in the middle and pin her. It's all you got to do. So after the match, Deanna Peraza was not happy. The two of them weren't really getting along uh, in that match. Uh, Swerve Strickland did issue an open challenge on Dynamite that was answered by the Butcher. So Swerve took on the Butcher one-on-one. -on -one. This is just, he's basically his point on Dynamite was to make his case for the championship. So. He beats him, of course, beats the butcher, gets on the mic, starts talking up, calling out Joe. He's got this big chain. You know, he talks about wrapping the chain around his neck, his big ass neck. <laughs> he goes, I don't have enough chain, your big ass neck to go around your big ass neck or whatever he said uh, was pretty funny. <clears throat> he said that he's going to keep taking out the security uh, until uh, all of Joe's personal security. You can bring all of them you want. I'm going to keep taking them out one by one until you give me what I want. And that's when Joe finally comes out. He says that uh, it's not his fault that Swerve lost and got knocked at, knocked back down the ladder. But he also kind of seems game to fight as well. And uh, Swerve, uh, Callus, excuse me, uh, winds up coming out. Don Callus comes out and gets in the middle of this as well and says that he wants Swerve to face Takeshita next week. So I guess more of Swerve trying to prove himself. So he's going to take on Takeshita next week. Swerve, of course, accepts the challenge and says after he's done with Takeshita, he's coming for Joe. So it feels like one more hurdle for Swerve now. I'm kind of tired of seeing Takeshita in these situations where he's going to lose, just taking loss to Osprey now, seemingly in a similar situation here to Swerve. Uh, I feel I'm hoping that this is like one of his last, you know, kind of big losses because Takeshita is a, you know, if you were going to start making like a new pillars, like he might be on my list. Like I really like Takeshita, you know, is, is a foundation of, of this new AEW. And he would also be my early candidate. I don't know who the hell is going to take the title off of Adam Copeland. He might be an early candidate. Don Callis, he might go back with Edge too. Those those fucking Canadians, man. So that might be kind of cool to have Callis and Copeland. Although I don't recall Jackal and Edge ever doing anything together on WWE. I don't remember. But uh, they might have some history there. So maybe that could make, make sense. But I feel like if it's not Takeshita, it should be someone like Takeshita that takes the belt from Adam Copeland, the TNT title, I should say, from Adam Copeland. So uh, fun stuff. We got a lot of stuff uh, on tap for next week. It's going to be uh, Osprey and Shibata and Swerve and Takeshita now. And like I said, Swerve, I feel like he's going to have to win that match. And when he does, maybe issue a final challenge to Joe and we do get the match accepted. Maybe one of those things where Tony Schiavone gets off headset. I've just been informed by Tony Khan that this match is booked now for Dynasty, and then magically we have a graphic somehow made five seconds later. That is one thing AEW should work on. They got these graphics made way too quick. A lot of times when these impromptu decisions seem to happen, they have a graphic made in seconds. I mean, I know you got top quality production team back there, but it takes more than just five seconds just to throw together a graphic. You got to do a couple things. So I could probably do it in like 90 seconds. I would need more than five seconds. Anywho, what was next? Uh, oh, yeah, the main event. The main event of Dynamite was Dynamite. It was fucking crazy. Cope, Cage, 3, TNT Championship, I quit match. And this was all kinds of fun. I knew this would be. This is in Toronto, man. And uh, Edge and Christian having a match like this in the main event for these fans. I was just looking forward to it because I knew... They weren't going to be walking through this one. This is one that's going to go on their legacy. This is one that they're going to remember and they have to come out for. And they did. I mean, they they really went hard in this match, beat the hell out of each other. I think my favorite part was the hockey fight where they put the hockey jerseys and brawled in the penalty box. Oh, my God. So good. And they were just hammering the hell out of each other. Edge gets busted open. I love that. I don't even recall the last time 
Adam Copeland voluntarily bladed. He might have done it in AEW, but shit, when was the last WWE match you saw any blood on his face? You'd probably have to go all the way back to the, the Foley match at WrestleMania 22 and whatnot. You know, all the crazy things he did in those years. So to see him uh, bloody and beaten was pretty awesome. We had Kill Switch and Nick Wayne out there, of course. So Edge was going to be fighting an uphill battle and they were out there to disrupt things. And that's when... Mernard and Parker, came, I'm sorry, Mernard and Garcia, Daniel Garcia and, uh, and Daddy Magic came out to help out, to help out Adam Copeland, and they wind up subduing all of the members of Christian's family there, and they handcuff, kill switch to one corner, Nick Wayne do another one, Mama Wayne just takes off running, and they've got Christian in the other corner, so all, everybody is handcuffed, nobody can do anything, and Christian is at the mercy of Adam Copeland. And so Copeland walks right up to him and he just gives him the shattered dreams, kicks him right in the balls. Christian, to his credit, does not give up. Referee asks him, do you give up? And he says, oh, no. And he's just like, ah, oh, he can't even talk. And he's just making noises and gurgling sounds and stuff. It's hilarious. And then Copeland goes and just kicked like rapid fire uh, shattered dreams to Christian's jewels. Just like kicks him about five more times in the nuts. Christian still does not give up, which at this point... Christian's a heel. A heel should give up by now, but Christian is refusing. The hatred is that deep. So Copeland goes outside the ring, goes under the ring to pull out a big case that's labeled Spike, and we all know what's in that. That is a baseball bat with a bunch of nails sticking out of it, all different which ways. So he takes it right up to Christian, and he just golf swings it right up into his taint, where the spikes stick right into your gooch. And just has, and you could hear it went like smack. You could hear it through the camera. You could hear the crowd sounded like they could hear it because they all oohed and odd when that happened. And oh man, that was uh, rough. So Christian got spiked in everything down there. And then Copeland kind of takes the spikes out of the taint and then reaches up to hit Christian in the head with Spike. And Christian finally, at this point, gives up. I mean, we were two seconds away from becoming a saw movie here and christian finally gives up and says i quit and adam copeland wins and becomes tnt champion in a brutal war that was fun ridiculous but fun i want my wrestling to be ridiculous if it's not ridiculous i'm not going to like it so uh the more ridiculous it is usually the better uh, although there is a limit but i don't think anything was crossed here and it was fun it was brutal it was gritty uh the crowd was into it it was a fun match for toronto and i was uh happy to see them in a you know main eventing a a, a match on the super station 26 years <clears throat> After I saw Edge wrestle in a couple of dark matches prior to Raw going on the air before his debut in person, you know, watching this guy, who's, who's this guy? <laughs> and now seeing this career that he's had, and now he's in AEW, which is a, something I never thought I'd see happen. And he's having his, having matches here with longtime, you know, friend, childhood friend Christian is just wild. And as someone that uh, I was uh, at SummerSlam 2000 for the TLC, I've watched these guys win championships. I've seen a lot of their career in person before, especially back in the day when they were younger and to see them, you know, as an old man, seeing these two guys that are both older than me, actually uh, out there competing at this level for a championship in a main event TV cable match. It's just fun. I'm proud of them. Just good to see. Very fun stuff from Cope and Cage. Loved it. Like I said, next week, Swerve and Takeshita and Osprey and Shibata. And I did not catch what else they have planned for Dynamite next week, but I know there's more than that. Dynasty is shaping up like this, even though not a ton of these matches are official yet. Osprey and Danielson is official, but Joe and Swerve is not. I'm assuming we're getting that. Mercedes and Willow is not. I'm assuming we're getting that. And I'm assuming Okada and Pac, or Pac, that might be official. <clears throat> Actually, I'm not sure, but if it is not official, it will be. And then, of course, we have that tag title tournament as well. So they're lining up a lot of good stuff here for Dynasty. That should be a fun show. WrestleMania is going to be a fun show. There have been worse times to be a wrestling fan, that's for sure. And now that we are three minutes past the top of the hour, if Collision was on, you guys would be missing it right now, but there is no Collision tonight due to the basketball games. So I'm going to be getting out of here in... 
just a minute once I go back to the chat here and see else see what else you guys are talking about and possibly answer some supers. Uh, let me see. Yeah, looks like we've got one from Mike Witt. Thank you so much, Mike Witt. I know you've got the little explosion next to your name, which uh, symbolizes or uh, uh, a... Uh, new member, but Mike Witt has been a member for a couple of years nearly. He's been one of the OG members. So even though it looks like he's a new member, he's not. Imagine a promo battle between MJF and The Rock. Yeah. Osprey wins the belt from Joe in London in August. Wow. You got Joe going to London. I don't. That's too long. Uh, book it. Did you see the Iron Claw yet? No, I've not seen the Iron Claw. I will get to it. Um, I mean, I just heard number one. It wasn't like... <laughs> It wasn't really a great movie. I mean, I think wrestling fans are interested in it because of the Von Erich story. Um, but man, it's gnarly and sad. I'll get to it, but I'm not in a rush to see Iron Claw, but at some point I will. <clears throat> but man, having Joe go all the way to London in August feels a little long. I think the title runs right now is as gobbed up it is, as it is in the, at the top. Uh, need to be a little bit shorter, and I think you can get a good quality run. I think you can get a good quality summertime run out of Swerve, you know, with maybe the tentative plan for him to drop it to Osprey at All In, unless Swerve starts becoming stone cold or something during the course of the summer and his popularity grows exponentially and you're like, shit, we can't take the title off him. We got to ride this wave, then do that. But, you know, if he's, uh, you know, if he's not doing anything too crazy, then that I think would be a good plan. But Joe making it to London that's just a little long for me. Um, <clears throat> Mike Witt, two more. Dare I say Greg Hogan could open Mania too? Yeah, that whole scenario, all those legends I mentioned, I didn't mention Hogan, did I? Well, he could definitely be a part of that because he as well is on relatively good terms with WWE. He did the voiceover for the whole Royal Rumble, right? So uh, he could be involved in that too. Brett and Hogan and Sean and all them in the ring together again. Oh man, it would be wild, but it would be fun. It would be fun to see. I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate it. Uh, Mario, appreciate the two from you. Cope really swacked on the gooch with the chair shot. He did. Uh, I mean, I, he just like the way he brought it up and just swung it up and it just like stuck into him like a, like a taint cushion. Oh my God. Uh, was probably uncomfortable. Even if spike was gimmicked, even though, if they, even if those were, rubber tipped or something uh, it just still probably not feel great uh yeah have batista come out there rodrigo that's another good one to be a part of that oh yeah that's right Le the let champion so i'm trying to think of aew one so you could get let champion lionheart and Painmaker. so that's three jerichos that hook might have to beat um because he was heel Jericho and list Jericho more in WWE. Give Jericho a retirement run in WWE and that's it. I don't know if he's ever going to go back to WWE. I don't know if he really, I don't know if him and Triple H really loved each other. And now that Vince is gone, I don't know. I I could see Jericho working with WWE in some capacity again in the future and future projects and whatnot. Uh, a retirement run in the ring doing matches. Fuck no. Hell no. He's uh, he, It's getting hard to watch him in the ring, to be honest. To be honest. <clears throat> Max, Mary Osprey. I mean, if he'd have me, I'm a big Osprey fan. He definitely makes me giddy. I mean, I fucking love the guy. I think he's tremendous. So uh, I, there's a lot of what I like about wrestling right now across both companies is there's a ton of not only wrestlers, but baby faces that I fucking love. I have not loved this many baby faces in a long time. You know, a lot, you know, over the years, a lot of babyface characters are lame. You can like them enough. Their matches can be great and stuff, but you know, the, the baby face character and you know, who we know them to be is uh, just, I've always been lukewarm to most of them, if anything. But you know, when you think about Osprey, you think, you think about Cody, you think about Sammy, Kevin Owens, Jay Uso, you know, even, even Rollins, I, I like, and Swerve who's becoming a face in AEW. You know, there's so many faces and just wrestlers in general that I'm interested in, invested in, and want to see more of. And I haven't had this many of wrestlers that I could say this about in a long fucking time. A long time. So that's one positive thing 
uh, that we have as wrestling fans right now is there's a lot to there's a lot to like about both companies. So I say uh, it's more fun to enjoy the positive than uh, revel in the negative, like so many tend to do in this community. But anyway, I got to get out of here. I still have to go to work tonight, which fucking sucks, but I'm going to get out of here and do that. Tomorrow night, please make sure you join us. We are going to be watching WrestleMania 15 together. I was at that show in Philly live and in person way up at the top with no fucking camera, but I was there and it'll be fun to talk about that one tomorrow night. So please join us. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Mike Witt. Hey, did your thing change over? (laughs) Mike Witt now has that red good mic work one. Did you just change over mid stream? That's crazy. But anyway, appreciate the two bucks. Was hoping for a Beth appearance Wednesday too. I don't know. Maybe Beth can't yet. I thought I thought that she couldn't appear because of a lingering legends deal, but I actually am not sure. So if we could someday get Beth in AEW, that would be pretty damn sweet. But anyway, you guys have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you so much for being here and I'll catch you guys tomorrow night for 